is apologies. I've received notice that uh, Pat may be just uh, slightly delayed. Any other apologies? Nope. Okay, then, members, agenda item two, chairperson's business. Uh, can I just take this opportunity uh, to advise members out of courtesy that in my uh, capacity as an individual MLA, I have launched a, a public consultation over uh, the next eight weeks or so until June the 10th in relation to a proposed private members bill to remove the exemption of teachers from the Fair Employment and Treatment Order. Committee has obviously done uh, its own work in relation to that, uh, engaging with a, a wide range of stakeholders, um, and I, I certainly hope as as wide a range of views as possible will respond to that consultation. Um, I'll do my best to keep the appropriate separation between uh, the uh, consultation that I have launched and, and the work of the committee. Um, members content with that? I know it was something a number of members had uh, been been vocal about and, and proactive on during the committee. It, it, it's a the legislative power in relation to it actually rests I fairly clear with the executive office. Uh, so um, I'll not be given uh, evidence to myself if we do get to committee stage, thankfully. Um, but happy to keep members up to date with that. If you have any questions to answer them, hopefully you, you'll be able to proactively respond to that consultation as well. We're obviously as a committee awaiting some further responses from stakeholders in relation to the, the, the work that we're doing on that ourselves. Okay, the only other item I wanted to raise as well, members, was uh, you may have seen in the press the announcement from the Minister of Education in relation to approximately £11 million being allocated to ongoing engaged programme funding, uh, with particular reference to summer activity and year seven assistance. My reaction was that it would have been positive if the Minister had been able to uh, update the assembly in relation to that by way of ministerial statement. Would members be content if we wrote to the minister to ask if it's possible to give a ministerial statement at the assembly in relation to that and encourage him to do so for other related matters? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, to note that, Clark, thank you. Okay, then, members, uh, agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meetings on the 14th of April 2021 at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Content. Thank you. Okay, members, I have no matters arising. And then agenda item five is our oral briefing from the Children's Law Centre in relation to special educational needs. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the Children's Law Centre table today? A briefing note from the committee clerk at page 18 of your main pack. A Children's Law Centre NGO Stakeholder Report on the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child at page 22 of your pack. And can I give a very warm welcome to Rachel Hogan, the Special Educational Needs Representative at the Children's Law Centre. Morning, Rachel. Good morning, Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. It's great, great to have you with us this morning. Um, thank you for all the work that you've been doing uh, in relation to Special Educational Needs. And have been countered your own work and the work of Children's Law Centre across many different committees and all party groups at the Assembly. And we, we know what an important contribution that you're making. So thank, thank you for that. Can I advise you that you have 10 minutes to make your opening statement? And then members uh, should have about seven minutes each to uh, ask questions and engage with you on matters of concern. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, so, as most of you probably know, the Children's Law Centre is an independent charity and we um, try to change children's lives using children's rights. A large part of our work involves working with children with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, the legal framework around 
uh, special educational needs and disabilities is in our view a very robust legal framework as it stands and that's before we have any SEND improvement um, coming in through the SEND Act. The difficulty with the system over the years in our view has been that it has been unlawfully operated by the Education Authority and I've been working for the Children's Law Centre since 2008 and I have colleagues going back to 1997 when the charity first started and special educational needs and um, operational practices have been a problem throughout that time. So the first thing I would say is that this issue predates the Education Authority and um, these are very much entrenched operational issues that have existed for many years and have really made their way into the Education Authority um, and they seem to have escalated in an unchecked fashion within the Education Authority. Um, our own advice service, we can see the, the increase in the work that's come to us. So just to give you an example, in 2013, we would have had about 384 uh, contacts about special educational needs issues out of a total of 1,909 contacts. Um, and bearing in mind we deal with all sorts of issues. Um, in 2015, which is just before the Education Authority became operational, we would have had about 590. In 2019, so once the EA had been up and running for a number of years, we had 1,634 queries about special educational needs. Um, and the following year, 2020, we had 1,574. So I think you can see from that there's been an exponential rise in the amount of concern around special educational needs coming through our service. And I know that colleagues in other charities and organisations would report the same. They've become extremely busy in trying to deal with very entrenched difficulties um, and trying to get problems solved. The challenge mechanisms that we use, well, the first port of call is always to try and work with the Education Authority to point out the difficulties and, uh, and try and remedy them. Other than that, we would use the Special Educational Needs and Disability Tribunal or SENDUST. Um, and in certain cases, we will use judicial review and we'll successfully use judicial review against uh, one of the Education and Library Boards for unlawful failure to carry out a statutory assessment through not be making an evidence-based decision. Um, and that was due to ignoring parental evidence in that particular case. Um, and there's a link to that in the briefing paper that we've provided if you wish to look at that. And that's going back to 2015. And we feel that that issue still hasn't been dealt with now, now today as we sit here. Um, I think it's important to note that the Education Authority has an incredibly high fail rate of sendist appeals. And the Education Authority have acknowledged this, they, they know this themselves. But just to give you a flavour, uh, in 2015-2016 there were 145 special needs appeals, of which only four were dismissed um, by the tribunal. So the rest of them will have settled or been resolved satisfactorily or won by parents. In 2018-2019 that had risen to 378 appeals, which is an incredible increase, of which only 11 were dismissed by the tribunal. So I think it's fair to say that in over 97% of cases, parents have obtained a successful outcome for their appeal. And that indicates to us that there's poor first instance decision making that is not evidence based. And that's our experience. Um, we feel that that needs addressed urgently because it shows that statutory assessment and um, decisions in particular and decisions around the specification and the content of statements uh, are not being carried out in a lawful way. The question really is, what has the EA done about that? Now that they know about it, what have they done about it and, and, and what projects are being taken forward? And also who's involved, who's being asked, what needs to be done in relation to that? Um, the Department of Education has had a long running special needs and inclusion review. Um, and, and I note that that hasn't drawn out the systemic operational failings as being a feature, although it has created new legal rights for children, which we welcome. Really, the issue at the heart of all of the problems we've had with special needs has been the operations carried out by, by say, special needs section of the Education Authority and before that the boards. The other thing we're concerned about at the minute, which is connected to this, is the plethora of consultations that have come out during the pandemic. So that includes on the new SEND framework, area planning for special schools and specialist provision in mainstream. Um, so the draft SEND regulations and the draft SEND code and we've also been responding to um, a call for evidence on educational underachievement. All of those are quite, quite closely connected with special educational needs. And those policies are really standing on the foundation that there'll be an enhanced mainstream sector. 
So those policies, in our view, cannot be successful if we don't have an enhanced mainstream sector. And we won't have an enhanced mainstream sector if children aren't able to access the special educational needs provision that they require at the time when they need it through various services that the Education Authority provides. So we actually believe that there needs to be an end-to-end -end process review of all statutory operations where the Education Authority might be involved. And that would include stages three, four and five as it currently stands of the Code of Practice. Uh, and we think that that would need to be done before the new framework is implemented, because otherwise these flaws will infect the new framework. And uh, we really don't want to miss the opportunity to have a new framework that is operated effectively. Public confidence in the Education Authority is an absolutely critical issue. Um, I feel that the Education Authority does recognise that and it does want to increase public confidence. Um, the reports that we've had over the last couple of years um, that have been very critical of the Education Authority have really recorded formally what parents have been telling us for years and children and young people and other organisations. And when you look at those reports from the Children's Commissioner, the Audit Office and the Public Accounts Committee, and you stand back and you actually look at what they say, um, it's astounding um, the level of operational deficiency that we've allowed to continue in Northern Ireland for many years. And not only that, but the impact that that has had on the legal rights of children and young people. And as I say, we have robust legal rights here and there's just non-compliance with those rights and we need that to be fixed urgently. The Education Authority, as I say, has it's put its hands up and it's acknowledged the deficiencies and we really welcome that and it's expressed a will to change its system and to transform its operational practices. It's absolutely critical that the Education Authority receives every support to do this effectively. Um, Children's Law Centre are supporting the Education Authority by taking part in a programme reference group which um, feeds into all of the different pro projects for improvement. But it'll come to nothing if it's not properly resourced and funded. So the Education Authority has to come up with a plan, it has to prioritise which service it is going to uh, improve first. But more importantly, it needs financial resources to enable it to do that. I think we could all agree that all of the services that children need um, are working over capacity. So there's, there's greater demand than there is supply, and that is the, the case across the board. Um, we're aware that there are service reviews ongoing in relation to stage three services, so that's educational psychology, autism support, speech and language support, behaviour support, um, and all those types of services. Uh, and there are real equality issues there. We want to see proper equality practices in place under Section 75, because this is going to involve possibly reallocating or moving around money between different groups of children. We want to make sure that all of our children are served and that there's a quality of opportunity across the Section 75 groups. The other thing we really need to avoid, um, and this may happen if we put too much pressure on the Education Authority in a sense, is that we're faced with a, a situation where we get headline wins or bare statistics that look as if there's improvement but there's actually not real improvement underneath the surface. So one example I would give there is, I suppose um, we'll hear about uh, compliance with the 26 week statutory timescale for production statements. Now, the first thing is that's a basic legal duty. Um, so I can't congratulate a public authority for complying with the law. I expect a public authority to comply with the law. And I expect to hear that it is complying with the 26 week statutory um, timescale. Um, although I acknowledge that a huge amount of work has had to go into getting to a stage where that, that might be possible. However, I am aware of one particular case um, where a parent has received a statement within time, but there appears to have been irregularities in the way that that's been processed, in that the statement was, was received in March, but was dated in January. Um, and if it was in fact ratified in January, then that means that the parent didn't get their 15 day statutory consultation period. Um, so we're looking at that at the minute and there's definitely an irregularity of some sort. Uh, and that concerns me because it means that I can't have confidence in the figures that are being reported. So I hope that that can be dealt with and explained and maybe it's just one particular case. We need to be able to have full confidence in the figures that are being reported. And we need to look behind those figures to the experience of the children and young people who are receiving the services. Uh, another area I think we need to keep an eye on is adult assistance. Adult assistance is a large cost element for special educational needs. Um, we don't want to see any knee-jerk reaction to cut costs. 
any decisions that are made about deployment of adult systems should be evidence-based and they should be based on evidence gathered here in Northern Ireland, including through consultation with children and young people, their parents and carers and the schools that provide the, the education on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for many children, adult assistance is a critical service and whilst there may be questions to be asked about how that's used and how it can be improved, uh, I think we need to be very careful here because this is part of the assistance that needs to be specified in part three of statements in order for those statements to be legally compliant. Um, so I think we really want to focus on the lived experience of children and young people and their parents and carers and to keep that focus there throughout this improvement process to make sure that parents are informed, consulted and they participate and so do children and young people with special needs and disability who are experiencing this. And you know, I think the Education Authority has, in the meetings that I've attended of the, of the programme reference group so far, has indicated very clearly an, uh, a will and a desire and an intention to engage um, actively with parents. And I really welcome that. And I want to see that continuing and to be meaningful participation. Um, the other thing I think we need to be careful about is that we don't shift all the focus to statutory compliance and forget about children who are at stages one to three of the Code of Practice which is described as non-statutory provision, um, and that's all of those stage three um, support services. So the framework is not statutory. There aren't timescales attached to that, for example, but they are extremely critical in terms of early intervention. In the Children's Law Centre's view, early intervention is the key to resolving all of these issues. If children are identified as having special needs at an early point, and then they receive the, the services that they need at the point of need, then we're going to cut a lot of costs later down the line, both human cost and financial cost. And the human cost of not providing for these children is absolutely enormous. Um, we see that in terms of disability discrimination. The Children's Law Centre has actually reached the conclusion that disability discrimination has become institutionalised within our education system in Northern Ireland due to the dearth of provision for disabled children to help them to access the curriculum. And that includes special needs support. We have received a disability discrimination declaration against the Education Authority in relation to failure to do a statutory assessment for a child who was on an extremely uh, reduced part-time timetable for a prolonged period in the absence of a statutory assessment. Um, so, you know, what do I mean by disability discrimination? We're talking about here children being sent home from school early, and this is normal in Northern Ireland now, that schools will send children home early. And sometimes the Education Authority are aware of that and complicit in it. Um, so while parents have a legal duty to make sure their children um, access full-time um, suitable education, our state authorities are sending children home on part-time timetables. And there's something wrong with that um, because it's informal exclusion. There's no regulation around it and it's not counted and monitored. So we want to see that being counted, monitored, checked and fixed essentially. So with children going home early, um, children who have been excluded from the school play, the school trip, the school photograph. We have children who are so anxious that they can't put their school uniform on. It's a whole production trying to get the school uniform on in the morning. They can't get into the car, they can't get out of the car, and they have great difficulty going in the front door to school. And we have to ask ourselves, what is it that's wrong with our educational environments that put such barriers in the way of disabled children, that they feel so unsupported, so fearful and anxious, that just going to school in the morning is a huge, huge expedition every single day and the stress that that causes to families. So I think we really need to keep our eye on inclusion and disability equality in connection with special needs provision. These things cannot be separated from one another. They're inextricably linked. Um, so I, I finish really by saying that what we need here is an open and transparent education authority that admits when it gets things wrong and takes steps to put things right quickly. We want to see legal compliance being the norm and strong governance uh, and management reporting. We want to see parental and uh, ch children and young people confidence and public confidence um, brought to a high level. And also that people who work in the Education Authority can be proud to work in the Education Authority and go into work happy every day and do their jobs as best they can with a manageable workload. We want to see equality of opportunity for children with disabilities. And most of all, we want to see evidence-based decision-making from the Education Authority, and that can only be done through consultation with affected people, such as parents and children, 
and full participation of those affected stakeholders. We want to see a functional and accountable education authority that carries out its legal functions. And those are very straightforward. Its legal functions in this sense are to identify special educational needs, to assess children who may have special educational needs, and then to make provision um, called for by the learning difficulties that those children have, and then to evaluate the outcomes of services that are provided. So it's not enough to, to write down on a piece of paper that a child is getting a service. We need to know what difference did it make to the outcomes of those children and young people, um, so that the system that we have serves the rights of our children and young people. And that's me finished, Chris. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, you've referred to some positive developments there, but otherwise um, that was uh, a damning uh, indictment on the uh, record of our education system to deliver on disability equality and inclusion. And you, you delivered it in a very calm and accurate way. But just to pick up on some of the points that you've raised there, Rachel, you, you've said that disability discrimination is institutionalized in our education system and that you have witnessed an astounding level of operational deficiency. Do, do, people have called previously for an, an independent inquiry into special educational needs provision in Northern Ireland. Is something of that scale still needed? I would be supportive of an independent inquiry just due to the level of impact and the duration and severity of the impacts for children and young people that we have seen um, because it's such a gargantuan task for the education authority to actually turn all of these difficulties around and I think it's really important that we acknowledge that harm has been done along the way. I mean many many children as we know have special educational needs um, I think it's around 68,000 at the moment of the last uh, NISRA figures. So 68,000 children have special educational needs. Um, that number has been obviously increasing markedly over the years, and the system hasn't adapted to cope with the pressures of that. Barriers have been put in the way to service access because of probably chronic underfunding and lack of governance and oversight. Um, and it's not as if the authorities didn't know about this because the likes of the Children's Law Centre have been raising these issues consistently since we were in existence. And certainly I know since I started in 2008, this has been my job, special education needs and disability. Um, and I have constantly brought this to the attention of the Education Authority and we've brought it to the courts and the courts have made um, declarations. We've brought it to the Special Needs Tribunal and they have made declarations. And I think, um, you know, we have to reflect back on what, what, is, what harm has been left in the wake of these operational failings. These are not small matters. And we shouldn't brush them under the carpet. Um, we need to recognise that children have suffered and families have suffered. And we're talking about very vulnerable families and vulnerable children here. You know, parents who are coming forward and saying, I need help. I, I'm struggling here. My child doesn't seem to be doing very well. They're coming forward saying primary two typically to, to, to say, I think there's something wrong. And they're being fobbed off and fobbed off. And by the time they get to primary four, the difficulties are maybe quite entrenched and then the system isn't responding. The impact on individual children and families, and then of course the, the vulnerable parent who maybe was a bit afraid to come forward, starts to think, oh, I'm just making a fuss over nothing here. And then gradually it becomes obvious that that's not the case and, and that children have been held back in their educational progress. So I, I don't think that we can get away from that fact. I think we need to really acknowledge the pain, the suffering, the upset, the distress, the anxiety and the harm that failure to provide for children with special educational needs costs, uh, costs, and we need to put the financial and human resources in place to resolve it urgently. It's perhaps a, a unfair question to a certain extent, Rachel, but the, the question is there. Why do you think people with responsibility have allowed such chronic underfunding, lack of governance and oversight, and discrimination of children with disabilities to occur? I can't say into the mind of someone who can do that because from where I sit as a children's rights advocate, I'm speaking to children directly and their parents and I'm taking evidence from them and I'm looking at it and it's quite obvious to me what needs to happen. Um, you know, that the outcome should follow the evidence, the decision should follow the evidence. And I think, you know, 
that's not a question that I can answer. That's a question that only the education authority can answer. Um, and not only the education authority, but going before that, the education and library boards, these things are not new, but they certainly became worse um, when the education authority came into place. And I suppose, you know, there were a lot of changes we'll have to take into account. There's a lot of change and transformation. We lost a lot of experienced workers. New people were brought in. There's a lot of change. So you can, you can allow for that up to a point. But after a certain number of years, you would expect to see um, systemization. Now, I think on the positive side, the fact that we have one authority and not five boards to deal with here in terms of improvement is a positive. So we could take a regional approach and we don't have to have silos of good practice and bad practice. There was good practice in some areas in the past. I wouldn't tar everybody with the same brush by any stretch. Some, uh, some areas were better than others in terms of their practice. But in terms of accountability, your, your question is who's accountable for this? I mean, that's a question for the Education Authority to answer uh, and to investigate and, and reach a conclusion about. And, and Rachel, the Children's Law Centre has years um, and significant expertise in years of experience and significant expertise in relation to improving rights compliant for children with special education needs and, and delivering equality and inclusion. Are, are you being engaged? Are you being listened to? Are you being included in this urgently needed and significant reform process? Uh, yes, I think I can say yes, we are. And um, I have attended now a couple of meetings of the programme reference group. And I will say I have been quite impressed by the, the level of urgency that's been given to it, the team that's been brought in to um, sort of design these programmes and projects, and the engagement has been good to date. But I feel we're at a very early stage. It's too early to say yet how effective the engagement has been. But I feel you know, very clearly the will is there. My instinct tells me the will is there, the people that have been put in charge of these improvements really want to make these improvements, um, and there's great pressure to do so. Um, but I can't judge what, you know, I'm not seeing it on the ground yet, obviously, because we're at a very early stage. There are a lot of reviews and work going on in the background that I have to say I don't, I'm not all over. I don't know what's happening. So just for example, I know that 97% of SENDIS cases are basically uh, result in a positive outcome for parents. I know the Education Authority is looking at that. Uh, no one's asked me about it. I would expect to be asked about that because I'm an expert in that. That's my job. That's what I do every day. So I offer my services there if anyone wants to, to use them. It maybe we just haven't reached that point yet. But I think there is a genuine will. Uh, and I think that comes from the new chief executive down. That's the sense that I have. Um, and that, that if I raise issues, and I, I do tend now to raise issues rather than necessarily filing a sentence to appeal, I might draw to the attention of the improvement team and say, this has happened. And I'm finding that I get quite a good response um, but you know we need to we need to give it a bit of time I think to get this to get it up and running get the structures in place get the funding in place and start to make the improvements but it'll be very important that service reviews in particular are transparent and involve openness consultation and participation I don't want to be uh, presented with the outcome of a service review we're going to do this and that and the other with literacy support for example I want to be involved at the early stage. What do you think we should do with literacy support? I want parents and children and young people to be involved at the start. You know, what's wrong with this service? What's good with it? What do you need? You know, for example, with it, what we have found is it's nearly transforming into an advisory service. So children are on waiting lists for a year plus whilst the school gets advice. And the school has said to me, but well, we've had this advice many times. We know what to do. We've done our bit. We need a literacy support teacher to come now. And, and help this child with dyslexia to learn how to read. We're in P5 now, we've been asking for three years. Um, so th this can't happen. You know, dyslexia, in a sense, we know how to help children with dyslexia. We've seen the results of that, of that fantastic service, uh, baseline scores and then final scores at the end of the intervention, it's amazing. Um, why is every child who needs that not getting it? We can't read and write. Um, so that's the sort of thing I want to see, that early engagement. Um, and I mean, you can't ensure a quality of opportunity without engaging affected parties at the outset. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Rachel. I'm out of time. Hopefully someone else will maybe pick up how COVID has, has hampered that need for um, reform and, and what work needs to happen in that regard. But thank, thank you, Rachel. I'll bring in uh, is Pat Chain with us, Deputy Chairperson Pat Chain, MLA. Thanks, Pat.
Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks, Rachel. And apologies, first of all, for missing the start of your presentation. I was detained on another issue. Um, I, I suppose just picking up on the last issue we were talking about in terms of the, the number of parents who bring cases to the Sandus Tribunal and, you know, the vast majority, I think you said 97%, actually win their case or it's withdrawn because there has been some satisfactory resolution with the parents beforehand. I mean, wh why, why is that happening? The reason for that is very, very clear in my experience. It is because the Education Authority's decision hasn't been based on the evidence. Cases are won or lost on the evidence. Uh, and what typically happens, if you take a, a refusal of statutory assessment, for example, um, I mean, the bar for a statutory assessment isn't all that high, but you would think, speaking to parents, that it was a, a series of mountains to climb to get a statutory assessment. The legal test is that it's probably necessary for the Education Authority um, to investigate what the child's special educational needs are. Probable necessity is a very low bar. Um, but we find that a lot of these are being refused. And then when I look at the evidence, I can see that the child meets the legal test. It's absolutely obvious on the evidence that the child meets the legal threshold and is beyond it in the vast majority of cases that I look at. Um, and so the only conclusion I can reach is that the Education Authority that looked at the same evidence that I've looked at made a decision that wasn't based on the evidence. Why? Again, I don't know. I'd like to know the answer to that. I know they're looking into this. Uh, I'd like to be involved in that. I'd like to feed into that and say, well, here's my experience. This is what I see. Um, you know, and even the, the judicial review that we took, LC's application in 2015, that mother had put together the most cogent statutory assessment request you could ever hope to see. It had paragraphs, subparagraphs, medical reports. It had absolutely everything. It was perfect. She put so much effort into it to describe her child's complex needs. And then it was refused. And there was absolutely no basis for that on the evidence. And yet the board proceeded to allow us to bring it all the way to court and for a judge to hear that case. Uh, and the judge basically concluded that they had ignored the parental evidence and that that was unlawful. So there's a whole ethos and culture issue around respect for parents' rights and children's rights here. That, you know, our evidence is somehow superior to parental evidence. Now, I think that the message of the EA will be taken on board and will be sending out to parents in in uh, work that's to be coming forward is that parents are the experts. And I would very much welcome that being the new ethos and culture of the Education Authority. Parents are the experts when it comes to their own children. They're the professional witness. They're the people who see the child from day to day and can make observations. And then, of course, the Education Authority has its own psychologists. Now, in the NICI report, um, in the Children's Commissioner's report, there's a very important uh, conclusion that they reached through the surveys that they carried out with educational psychologists. And that was that psychologists for the EA were actually recommending statutory assessments, and then those were being refused. So the EA was also ignoring its own evidence. So there are very serious questions to be asked around that. And I think the Sandist figures, I mean, Sandist panels know the EA very well. They're, they're specialist panels. They understand the evidence. Um, and, and those panels are robust in terms of the way that they scrutinise evidence. Don't just walk in and win a case. They will go through with a fine tooth comb the legal requirements and the evidence. And um, the other thing that you'll see is that the Education Authority very often would concede a case just at the point where they had to put in a case statement. So the parent goes to all the trouble of requesting a statutory assessment, puts together a case, file, you know, files an appeal, does all of that, and then just at the deadline where the Education Authority has to explain its decision, it concedes and decides to carry out a statutory assessment, maybe the day before. Now, when you have to file a sentence appeal, you can add six months to the time it has taken to get your child help. By the time you get to hearing, get a decision, get a compliance with that decision and get it operational. Some of these parents have had to do two appeals for the same child, so refusal of statutory assessment. Then the child gets a statement that is not properly drafted, which is another enormous issue. It's not specified properly in accordance with Article 16 of the 1996 order. Um, vague, wishy-washy language, it's not enforceable. Um, that's another thing we need to really be looking at very closely in terms of legal compliance. So we'll have two appeals to get to a final statement that is fit for purpose. And that will have been on top of all the time it took to get to the point of realising my child's not getting this help, it's not coming. I've waited, I've been patient, I've, I've followed the advice I've asked. Um, and then, you know, the other things that parents don't always know about their legal rights, so they don't know they have a right to 
ask for a statutory assessment themselves. Yeah. Uh, so the school can request one and so can the parent. Um, so, yeah, there's these are not small problems and all of them in their own right are quite hefty problems to work through. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a disgraceful situation, I think. But if you were given the power to go into the education authority to resolve that, how would you do it? Well, it's very straightforward. When the Education Authority is making the decision about statutory assessment, it needs to look at the evidence and it needs to look at the legal test. The first thing I'd be doing is training the decision makers on what the legal test is, because I'm starting to ask myself, do they know what the legal test is, what the legal threshold is? You know, what practices have developed over years? What do officers believe? What are they being trained? Um, and the same about specification of statements. What are they being told to put in statements? Um, all of that needs to be teased out. So you have to make it out. You know, if I'm looking at a case, I, I take the bundle of papers, I look at what the parents said, I look at what the school has said, and I look at what anyone else has said, and I draw a conclusion based on that evidence, a, prof a professional judgment, if you like. It's a, it, there is a level of professional discretion and judgment in the decision. Um, it's probably necessary. So you don't want so much formula around it that it becomes very criteria-bound, but it has to have a certain standard. Uh, and it needs to be evidence based, and it needs to be consistent, uh, and it needs to there needs to be equity in decision making. Uh, so I really am at a loss to understand how the decisions have been made, because I look at the papers and it's quite obvious to me what the answer to the question is. So we need to know why is why that happened, how it happened, and why it was allowed to continue for so long. Okay, thanks for that, and uh, I suppose. One of the biggest issues in any trying to bring about change in any organisation is to try and change the, the ethos and the culture. Uh, and, I mean, clearly that's a big task. But if, if you don't mind, I'd like to move on to another issue. And I don't know whether it has been covered. If it has been covered, just tell me and I, I'll, I'll drop it. But we, we've heard some harrowing evidence at the committee recently about uh, restraint and seclusion of children in schools. And um, there seems to be no urgency in the department to overhaul the current uh, policy. And I'd like to hear from yourself um, what, your, what you and the Children's Law Centre think of the current policy, particularly uh, its shortcomings from a children's rights perspective. Yeah, I mean, this again is related to special needs provision because very often we find that the behaviours that end up resulting in a restraint or a seclusion have come from failure to identify or provide for the child's special educational needs. Uh, and we have seen this over the years where, you know, children have been held or they have been placed away from their peers, segregated in some way and secluded. And there really is... There's really no regulation around that particular issue. I mean, there's certain policies, but, you know, with the Mental Capacity Act that regulates restraint in certain settings, um, it doesn't protect under 16. So there's all sorts of issues with that and whether it's compliant with the UNC or RPD and so on. But in school settings, there's a big question mark really over, well, what is the policy? What is the framework? How is it monitored? What's the accountability? How is it recorded? Are parents informed? Um do schools know what they're doing? Are they trained in disability law and disability equality? I mean, I think that's a massive issue. I think there should be mandatory training on disability equality and human rights for all uh, staff who work in schools, not just teaching staff, um, caretakers, dinner dinner ladies and dinner persons, um, uh, classroom assistants, school secretaries, all of these people are coming into contact with children with disabilities and they need to understand the rights of those children. I think there's a, there's a real, uh, we're really behind in Northern Ireland in terms of disability equality and inclusion. So we've got a SEN and inclusion review that's all focused on SEN and not enough focused, I think, on inclusion. Um, and restraint and seclusion are part of that seclu seclusion, uh, being treated differently, being treated unfavourably, being a second class citizen being viewed by peers, you're that bold child that goes and sits over there in the corner. Um, there's a whole huge piece of work in terms of disability equality and pumping resources, time and effort into making sure that the people who are with these children understand those children's rights and also making sure that the children themselves understand it is not okay for my rights to be trampled upon, for me to be restrained, secluded, 
treated this way because I have a disability and um, spoken to in a certain way. The children themselves need to be empowered with that, that knowledge. Now, the department does have a reference group in relation to restraint and seclusion. And I'm pleased to say that they have invited Children's Law Centre onto that group. And we've had one meeting to date. Um, so it's at an early stage. My sense is that the department does want to deal with this issue in quickly, as quickly as possible. I think it recognises that it is an extremely serious issue. I think we also need to look at what's health doing. Uh, because in, in previous evidence, we had raised issue about chemical restraint of children during um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and I think there's been a bit of a flurry of activity on the health side of things in terms of trying to look at, well, when do we, when do we restrain? So I think there needs to be some coherence across these different government departments so that we have a bit of a standard, you know, a minimum standard of the way that we treat disabled children in accordance with their legal rights. And I think, again, this is a very urgent matter. We can't have an incident happening tomorrow. Uh, I mean, I listened to the evidence that Deirdre Shakespeare gave about her son, Harry, being strapped into a chair. Um, and we had some awareness of, of that. And, you know, it's just horrific to any right thinking person. But the problem is that within the school system, certain ways of treating children have become viewed as being normal. And we need to completely upset the apple cart in that regard and pump in training and information and knowledge, which our school staff want and are only too happy to make adjustments when things are brought to their attention in most cases. Yeah. Okay, Pat. And, and, and sorry, could I just finish off, uh, Chris, sure. just on, on, on the issue of mandatory training? Because some of the evidence we heard was about um, sort of physical mannerisms of children when they're, when they're under stress, that, that they become manifest. I think uh, somebody can correct me on the term. Is it stepping? Yes, yeah, stepping. Uh, and... and uh, you know, that's a sign that the child is under stress. And and that's a point where some de-escalation process should be put in place. But on the yeah. contrary, children are being restrained, which is increasing, obviously, the stress that they're under. So, I mean, it's, issues like that need to be resolved. Mm -hmm. by the And that's a very basic issue. Anyone with sort of basic autism training would yeah. know that. But I mean, I've seen I've seen instances of that. I've seen a, a primary or I've heard of a primary one child who had very typical autistic presentation, if that's it's OK to put it that way. You know, nothing out of the ordinary, no challenging behaviour of such typical autistic behaviour. Uh, and this was around sort of circle time you know, where the children all had to sit in a circle and listen to a story or whatever. Um, and this child start with their stimming would involve poking their face, which was a sign, you know, I'm distressed. But uh, the assistant in that case restrained the child, kept them in the circle, put their arms around the child to keep his hands down from his face, believing that she was stopping the child from hurting himself, when actually she was hurting him more in, in a sense because he, she wasn't allowed to express his upset. And that's a typical training issue. That, that's a lack of knowledge at a very basic level. Um, and that's why mandatory training is very, very important because when people are in part of the knowledge and the training, they know what to do. They're not going out purposely trying to hurt children in the vast, vast majority of cases, the opposite of that. These people go into teaching because they're, they have a vocational side to their nature and they want to nurture children. Uh, it's ignorance and lack of knowledge and lack of lack of human rights and disability training. Thanks, Pat. Okay, thanks for that, Rachel. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Rachel. Robin Newton, MLA. Robin, I think you might need to unmute your mic. Thanks. Sorry, I thought you were controlling it, Chair. Sorry. Apologies. Thank um, you. Can I welcome Rachel then uh, and thank you, Children's Law Centre, for again uh, appearing uh, with us. I think uh, a number of the points, uh, the position of the committee, uh, I think you've covered this, Chair. We've been extremely supportive of both the parents and the principals uh, within special education needs through meetings uh, which have been both formal and informal. And, and we would want to be assured that the public can have confidence in the provision that, that is uh, uh, given to, to, to children, uh, children in particular, but extending up into the adult years of, of the school time. I think it's absolutely critical within any caring society. I have a number of short questions, Chair, if, if Rachel, happy enough to read them 
Bowers say them, uh, and then Rachel can respond to each of them how she how, how she feels uh, appropriate. <clears throat> the first one is a short one, but maybe she, in terms of the tribunals and the appeals, is there one area that has dominated it, uh, and indeed has the pandemic uh, had an impact upon upon that that area. In terms of the description that uh, Rachel gave uh, about the child with stress, anxiety, couldn't get into, couldn't get out of the car on the way to school, and the disability discrimination uh, that she indicated was an endemic. Is there any relationship between the school, education, and indeed health to address uh, those, those issues? And I think Rachel mentioned uh, as well that uh, indeed she felt financial support uh, was necessary uh, in this same area. And I think we probably all agree with that uh, in terms of uh, overall provision for uh, additional schools uh, and uh, uh, and same provision in generally. General, would, uh, would you like maybe just to outline your thoughts on those areas, uh, Rachel? Yes, uh, thank you for those questions, uh, Robin. In relation to the sendest appeals, mm -hmm. the dominant feature of those in our experience is refusals of statutory assessment. So very, very basic legal threshold, just as I've described. Mm -hmm. sure. um, that's the predominant area, and that's the one that is really, really shows us that there's a lack of evidence-based decision-making. The, the EA had been using sort of informal I think there were informal panels at a time to make these sorts of decisions around statutory assessments and also about classroom assistance allocations. Uh, it was all very sort of shadowy and lacking in transparency and procedure and protocol and very difficult to find information about. Um, and that was one of the things I was impressed with in the Children's Commissioner's uh, report that they did. And we sat in the advisory group for that. They went out and found the information from various sources. They couldn't get it from the Education Authority at the time. So they went out and surveyed and researched and spoke to parents and psychologists and other organisations. And they gathered and gathered and gathered this information. Um, and I think that's just what we need to see the end to that sort of shadowy, closed door situation. We need open doors. Um, we need absolute transparency from the Education Authority. And we wanted to admit when it can't get something done in a compliant way and tell us why and ask for help. We don't want anything hidden anymore. We don't want records altered, backdated. We don't want to see that. It's totally unacceptable. We can't have it. Um, so, as I say, statutory assessment and also content of statements is the other um, one. And that'll be around things like classroom assistance not being specified in statements or specialist teaching hours uh, or other uh, provision. It's, it's a legal requirement that when you draft a statement, the provision the child's going to get is specifically drafted into that. What exactly is it? What are they going to get? And that makes it legally enforceable. Now, the Education Authority has developed devices over the years to dilute that specification so that, for example, they might say the child has access to a level of assistance. Well, sure, that could mean anything. Or they might say the child has access to 30, to 30 hours of assistance, but then four other children might have access to the same one, and we don't know this. So we have been doing a wee bit of work with the Education Authority around that in strategic meetings, and we were going to talk to them. They had agreed to specify in all final statements. I don't know if they've actually carried that through or not. I think they may have. Um, but we wanted to do further work with them on what do you mean by specification and what does the Children's Law Centre mean? And can we develop words, phrases, etc.? Because it would take a huge amount of this send us stuff out of the way. It's not necessary. Uh, and other work circular arguments that we have every day. So on the appeals, uh, that's what it, those are the main issues. The pandemic has slowed down access to appeal rights just because of the disruption. And I know the tribunal service has opened the waterfront as a hearing centre to try and process the cases. Um, I haven't seen a particular change in the characteristics of the cases coming forward. I think we're seeing much, much of the same. It's just going to take a bit longer to get things resolved. Um, you'd asked about um, the children who are suffering the stress and anxiety and potentially discrimination and what the role is of different agencies in relation to that. Absolutely. Um, this is not, none of this is the EA on its own or schools on their own or parents on their own. When you're talking about children with special educational needs, you are talking about a multidisciplinary team around the child. You're talking about children's services cooperation. 
um, and the child getting all the services that they need, whether they're from health or education or school or external organisations that have expertise in a particular disability. All of that needs to be wrapped around the child um, and all of it needs to be evaluated as to its effectiveness on a regular basis. Uh, and particularly if it's in a statement of special educational needs, it needs to be specifically set out and then monitored through annual review um, or earlier meetings if those are needed. But absolutely, um, health, health input is very important here. We have a lot of children waiting two years plus to get an ASD assessment. Where does that leave schools? Uh, you know, and where does it leave parents? Mm -hmm. And where does it leave the children? Uh, but we can still, special education needs provision doesn't rely upon a diagnosis. We can still make the provision without the diagnosis based on the presentation. Uh, and then the last point, I think you had asked about financial support. Um, it's absolutely critical that we pour money into early intervention. We have been saying this for absolutely years. We, we said it in our response to the um, original consultation on the SEN review, uh, that really, you know, there's going to be a cost here to having an efficient system because we're going to have to maintain all these children who are relying on classroom assistance and statements, who if they had have had early intervention, might now be independent learners and aren't. So we've got to keep those children going with the assistance that they now need, but we've also got to pour money into those early services so that you know, we don't have children with dyslexia sitting for two and three years not learning to read and write. There's just no excuse for that. Uh, and the department was criticised for not increasing funding in the judicial review, a, a, a different judicial review that we took on dyslexia. The department was criticised because it had refused a, a request for additional funding to one of the boards in that case. So we, you know, we need to provide the services. The other thing is, how much unmet need do we have out there? The various reports have pointed out we need to measure the unmet need. So I'd really like to know how that is now being measured because we can't redesign services if we don't know who needs them. So let's count, let's find out how many schools have children sitting there that if they were able to refer them all, they'd refer them all. Who are these children? How many of them are there? What service do they need? What level of service do they need? How often do they need it? What's it going to cost? Those are all, those, you know, those calculations need to be made. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, just that, yeah. that piece of work on met need, I think, is a, a, a critical piece of work that, uh, however, that uh, might be tackled. Can I just briefly, Chair, will you indulge me with yeah, a very final, quick question? Go ahead. Yeah, final question. Thanks. Were, were you talking, uh, Rachel, about the, the children being sent home from school? Uh, I mean, is, presumably that would be both uh, mainstream schools uh, and indeed uh, special schools where, where they, uh, for whatever the reason is, the, 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 the child is sent home uh, to school, the child with special education that needs to sent home? Yes, it, it happens in, in both mainstream and in special schools. It's more prevalent in, in our work in mainstream schools. But there are children in part time and reduced timetables across the school estate. Um, and there would be children who don't have an appropriate school placement who've been suspended and are placed on a rolling suspension, which of course is a more formal process. But you know, we have children regularly, regularly not in full time uh, education. We have cases of children who've had disrupted education. I'm thinking of what I'm dealing with a child who hasn't had a full time education, say, since P6, and I think he's going in, in second year now. Um, so that raises all sorts of questions about, well, why did he not get earlier support? Why was this not fixed in P6? Why are we now in second year? What type of placement is, is he needing? Is this placement sufficient? Are there enough specialist placements? Does he need one of them? Uh, and you're sort of, you know, going along and going along, and we'll try this and we'll try that. But my view is if you have a child on a part-time timetable for a prolonged period, something isn't working and you need to do something different. Um, and if it's not acceptable for parents to educate their children part-time, then it's not acceptable for, acceptable for the state to do it. Um, our children are entitled to an effective education, one that meets their needs. They're entitled to achieve exam accreditation where they're capable of doing that, and life skills um, and social skills, and to be part of something, to be part of a community, not to be somehow not as good as everyone else. I mean, I had a six-year-old once crying in my office saying, it's just not fair. I'm not allowed to stay till break time. I have to go home. It's not fair. Why am I not allowed to stay with my friends? Um, good question, I had to say. Um, he was in the wrong type of placement, as it turned out. So um, I think we need to know, schools need to know that it's not okay to do that. 
in an informal way on a regular basis. You know, if there's an immediate health and safety concern, you could possibly justify it. Um, but it's just not okay to let that drift on. Um, and the authorities are very well aware of it because we've raised it with them on numerous occasions. Well, I suppose the one great note you have raised is that uh, things since the formation of the Education Authority seem to be moving, at least uh, maybe even so slowly, but in the right direction. Well, I think since the report, the critical reports have come out. Yeah. Um, and since the new chief executive has come in, um, I think there's a, there's a change. And there's it's a golden opportunity. I mean, these if we can get all of this sorted out, I won't have a job to go to, fair enough. You know, that's okay. But if we can sort out all of these issues, if we can look at all of these issues now and really be prepared to criticise ourselves as a society and say, look, this, is, this isn't right. And, and we could turn ourselves into leaders. We could lead the way in how we should be treating children with special needs and disabilities. We could implement the, the UNCRC and the UNCRPD. So it's absolutely a golden opportunity. And I want to make it very clear. I fully intend to 100% support the Education Authority in positive changes that it wants to make. Um, and I commend those who are trying very hard to do that. It's a, it's a huge challenge and a huge task and support is going to be required. I do think the will is there to do it. Um, and I'm an optimist by nature. I certainly work towards the best result we can get for our children and young people. Thanks, that, Robin. Okay, thanks, thank you. Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, ML? Thanks, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, Rachel, for your uh, very strong uh, presentation. Um, I have to say uh, I'm completely shocked. Uh, in fact, I would go further, disgusted, horrified, disappointed, embarrassed by the figures that you have shared with us today. 15, 16, 145 SEN appeals, four, four dismissed, just for the record again, 18, 19, 378, 11 dismissed, 97% of parents put through hell by the incompetence and laziness of the education authority who failed to, to, to live up to the mistakes they've made, instead attempted to cover them up, made a bad situation worse, and through all of that, many, many hundreds of children and families suffered unbelievable pain as a result of complete and utter incompetence. And today, I uh, uh, want to send out our support to those families because uh, as much uh, as those figures uh, are, are shocking, what is more shocking is what's happening behind those figures. Uh, because I, I've seen how parents and children have struggled, how they've fought very hard against a system that was working actively against them which is very clear from these figures. How on earth you can get an over, a rate uh, uh, to overturn it 97%? It stinks of incompetence. Uh, and a serious flaw in the system of poor decision-making as well needs to be tackled uh, head on. Uh, and you, you're right, that, that, that this is something that, that, that will need to be done and dealt with very, very quickly. The Education Authority have many answers, many questions to answer over the course of the next few months and they should be apologizing very openly and strongly to these families and apologies won't go far enough we need to act now bluntly speaking chair what is more worrying is the fact that the numbers almost doubled in the absence of a minister and in the absence of the assembly so the collapse of the assembly directly obviously fed in to the increase of these numbers so there's a political failure here on the part of politicians who didn't cooperate and work together to bring back the institutions. Children were failed as a result. That's very clear from those figures. Uh, just in relation to the pandemic, if that was figures prior to the pandemic, Rachel, <laughs> there's no doubt that those figures have worsened uh, since or, or during the pandemic. So with that said, what is your assessment of the experiences of children and young people with special educational needs and their families over the period of the pandemic to date? Very hard to answer that in, in a few lines, Daniel. Um, and I think I don't think we have seen the full impact of the pandemic yet by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think in one sense, the special educational needs of children were nearly put to one side, if you like, and put on pause while everything else was going on around them. Um, we've had, you know, obviously a lot of children have stayed at home and ha had to be home educated while their parents were trying to work and maybe work with a number of different children. Um, and we have heard reports of that causing great distress and regression in children. Um, 
I honestly don't think we've seen it, even the start of, of the wave that's going to come after this in terms of how far behind some of these children are going to be in their learning. Uh, now, there was, during the latter part of the pandemic there, um, although schools were closed, it was possible for vulnerable children to go into school. Um, so at least they were in school, but they weren't receiving their special educational needs support at its full strength at all. And I'm just thinking of one example for where a child who had a very disrupted education had been put into a specialist class, one of these um, specialist classes that has been um, sort of popped up as a result of the area planning. Um, and that child was then being asked to go into a normal classroom with a group of children supervised by staff and rotas, which is not the same as a specialist class with a teacher and a classroom assistant and one or two students. And the whole point was that he couldn't tolerate a normal environment, but he was being asked to go in and go into this supervised education. So, you know, that's held that child back by probably another year. That's one child. Uh, we have 68,000 children with special educational needs. I think we need to stand back and take, once we get into more of a, a regular routine again, stand back and take stock of what's going on here. The other thing I'm getting inquiries about is therapy input. So children who need, and this is special schools as well, um, children who need direct speech therapy, for example, and occupational therapy don't seem to be getting direct support in some cases. I'm getting different reports about it, but certainly some people don't seem to be getting that direct therapy. So not only are they not getting their basic academic needs and educational needs met, they're not getting therapies that facilitate their access to education and enable them to communicate uh, within that, that setting. So, you know, I think, have children had their special educational needs met fully during the pandemic? No. Have they, had they been having them met fully before the pandemic? No. Um, so I think there's going to be, it's, we're just in a really a perfect storm here, I suppose. We're having to recoup the losses caused by the pandemic on top of the losses that were caused by poor operational practices, unlawful practices and failures of legal compliance. And we've let down the children who need us the most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think that's an important point. I think it is important to point out that, uh, that there was a crisis here prior to the pandemic that has been worsened during it and there has been a, a, a political failure and a systemic failure uh, to look after the needs of these children. I, I think that ministers in the executive uh, need to understand on a day-to-day -day basis what a single parent or parents go through with a child uh, that, 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 is special that has special educational needs uh, and the huge challenges uh, that there is, particularly that have arisen uh, throughout uh, this pandemic because it, doesn't, it just doesn't seem to be on the radar. No matter how hard uh, we raise this issue, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, on the radar uh, at all. J just with, with that said, the, the, the uh, following question, you, you raised an interesting point. Do you believe the Coronavirus Act 2020 as it was applied uh, to education, particularly special educational needs, was compliant with international human rights standards. Uh, and could you explain the effects the Act has had on our children from your perspective uh, uh, as, as parents uh, have reached out uh, uh, to you in recent times? Yes, well, obviously, um, we actually have a number of legal actions in relation to the modification notices that were issued so when the Coronavirus Act was enacted, it gave the Department of Education powers to modify existing legal duties, and they exercised that power by modifying SEN, the entire SEN framework, essentially the whole substance of it was modified to the point where a best endeavours duty could be applied if for reasons related to the pandemic services couldn't be provided fully. Um, and you know, there was no consultation around any of that. There was no equality screening at the earlier stages to see if we do this, what will happen. Um, and this is, you know, this is not just a problem again that has arisen in the pandemic. Equality screening is not being done properly by government departments across the piece and public authorities. And that includes the Department of Education and the Education Authority. So we currently have three uh, legal actions pending um, leave hearings for judicial review against the Department of Education in relation to failure to comply with its equality scheme uh, and breach of Section 75 equality duties because these these uh, modifications were brought in with devastating impact, you know, grave and serious impact on a group, a particular group of the public, a section of the public. Um, and we think that, you know, what we can learn from this, we need to learn the lessons of the pandemic, but again, there's an opportunity when you see how things have gone wrong, well, how can we put them right? 
there's an opportunity for all departments and public authorities to stop and go back and look at their equality screening processes. These need fixed. They're not good enough. No, 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 they're, 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 they're not. And you're, and you're, and you're, and you're an out. Final question then, yeah, thanks. And you're, and you're an out, uh, uh, Richard, do you believe uh, that schools were provided with adequate advice and resources to support SEN children over the period of the pandemic. And just, just as a slight point off that, do you believe SEN children have pay, paid a heavy price uh, for this pandemic? I think the schools have struggled markedly throughout the pandemic, particularly you know after the first stages when we all, we all got sort of a bit of a fright and didn't know what was happening and there's a bit of an excuse there, I suppose, for things not to be running perfectly. But as, as the pandemic progressed, um, one of the things we had called for was um, a temporary continuity direction to allow for a particular, or guidance to allow for a particular standard of remote learning and input. But it seemed to vary very widely from school to school and different families have very different experiences in relation to it. Um, and schools, you were constantly looking at Twitter and schools were finding notices being placed on Twitter, you know, five to five on a Friday night. And then they were having to come in and prepare their children for the for the next sort of state of affairs on, on Monday or whatever. Um, so, you know, I think schools have struggled in terms of resources and financial resources and human resources. I think my impression is that many of our school leaders are completely exhausted at this stage um, and have found it very, very difficult. Uh, but worse than that, as you say, it's our children with special educational needs have been left without the provision that they require in order to enable them to access any form of education. They need these provisions to be in place so that they can access education. When you take the provision away, you take away the access. When you take away the access, you, you're potentially discriminating against those children. Um, and it's the impacts of that. As I say, I think we're going to see some children, some children will bounce back quicker than others, other children may well regress and require more provision. And that, again, is going to have a cost and a knock-on effect and put pressure on the various services. So we need to build our services back to a better level than they were before this and, and give them a bit of ability to flex up uh, and to increase their provision as required as the needs emerge, as they will do. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Daniel. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Rachel. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Rachel. Um, thanks for coming on today. <clears throat> I have no doubt with some of the stuff that you've shared with us, as Daniel has alluded to, um, in terms of the figures and some of the statements, it's, it's really quite shocking for anybody, perhaps, who hasn't been invested in trying to address the shortcomings for children uh, with uh, special educational needs. Um, thank you for your service. I think you said you'd been involved since 2008 which is, is quite, a, quite a number of years to be at, at the forefront of, of, of this. And I'm sure at times, uh, like we as politicians, get tired of seeing a lack of change, that you have also seen that lack of change. And I'm sure it's been frustrating. So I just want to thank you um, for your service in particular, Rachel, and through the Children's Law Centre. And certainly in terms of the validity of what you're saying and reputation, reputationally, I don't think there's anybody who'll call into question what you've shared today because you haven't sensationalised it. You've absolutely given it. Uh, the, the raw facts as they are, it's sensational enough. I think, I think you opened up with this statement where you said disability discrimination is institutionalised. That was certainly a, a, a awakener for me. Uh, I was engaged for this at the start, but I mean, when we looked at that, and, and you, you've given a figure of 68,000 uh, young people and with a uh, special educational need. Would you say, for, uh, Rachel, that that 68,000 figure uh, is actually is the is the accurate sort of figure, or looking at the backlog of cases, but that the, the um, special educational needs panel that was set up by, by Sarah Long recently was to tackle um, that that those are those are those are accurate figures. Uh, it's difficult. To, I suppose it's difficult enough to say. The Department of Education has currently changed the coding for special educational needs to try and make the figures more accurate. Um, and there have been some queries raised around around that, I suppose. Um, children with medical needs have been taken off the register, um, but they're supposed to be left on the register if they have SEN as well. And I think there was a lot of confusion in some schools, rightly or wrongly. They did receive training on it. Um, and some children were being, with autism, for example, were being taken off the register because autism is a medical need. But obviously they still had SEN, they still had social communication difficulties, social, emotional, behavioural welfare difficulties and things like that. Um, 
one of the other sort of slightly worrying things at the minute is that the um, system that schools use to record the numbers of children we send is going to get an update um, in the spring, which this is. And that is going to drop off all the stage ones off the system unless the schools go in and manually put them in. And that's because of the, the move from five stages to three. So stage one won't be a stage anymore. Um, but there's no IEP attached to the current stage one. And there's probably logic to that. But some of those children who are on stage one would need to be kept on the register because they do have needs and they do need to be monitored. And the question is, do schools have the time, resources, the know-how to sit and manually put those on? Um, so it would be interesting to see what the next set of figures is for the number of children with special educational needs so that we can see has there been a significant drop-off. Um, so the number had gone down to 67,000 after that last adjustment, but it's crept back up to around 68 again. Uh, and I think that the number of children with statements has gone up in the last year. So it's 5.8% of the population now as opposed to 5.3. So we're still we're still having a lot of children getting statements and it's a, it's a, a larger proportion than you might have elsewhere. And I know that's something that the, the authority might be looking at too. So um, I think you know the aim of the department is that the figures will be more accurate to enable better service planning. And I, I agree, having spoken to them about it and having looked at the training around it, that to me seems to be the legitimate aim of it. But we still need to be, you know, <laughs> Unfortunately, I have learned you have to be cynical and scrutinise and question. You can't take anything as read when it comes to special educational needs, and that's not right, but you have to question absolutely everything. And then one of the ways to combat that, and you talked about specification terminology, so some of the answers and replies that we would get or you might get um, on the face of it, as you've said, that this child has access to 30 hours care, when actually, in essence, it might be less than eight, yeah. um, which, which, which is almost, it's not criminal, but it's almost criminal, um, if, if it's done in a deliberate manner to obviously the absolute facts. Is there something that we can do in terms of um, that, that scrutiny level, not just the, the committee, I don't mean that, I mean all of us, uh, and yeah. that scrutiny of, of, of um, to, paring down on what, what's being reported, basically to understand the absolute needs and requirements? Well, first of all, the, the, the behaviour you've, you've described there is unlawful. It may not be criminal, but it is unlawful because Article 16 of the 96 order requires specificity in statements. Now, this issue was raised during evidence sessions about the Senate Inclusion Review and through some of the work that we did and others, including CDSA, Children with Disabilities Strategic Alliance and others. Um, the, the Education Committee actually proposed amendments to the SEND Act, which will change the requirement to specify to the requirement to specify the nature and extent of. So, the education uh, scrutiny has resulted in this problem being underlined and, and the legislation will be strengthened even further. But then what we're seeing in some of the SEND implementation consultations is attempts to water that back down again. So you're constantly fighting and battling over terminology. And I think in order to scrutinise it, we need to be in agreement as to what is the terminology. What does specification mean? To me, it's very simple. It means write down very clearly what the child's going to have. So if they're, if they're 30 yards of classroom assistance has been shared with four others, then write that down. That's open to some transparency and that can be challenged if it's not an evidence-based decision. Um, so I think probably the way to look at this is to look at the different projects that the Education Authority is going to bring forward. They're going to bring forward waves of projects which they need the Department of Education to fund. And I think we need to look at what are the priority projects. And that, if that might be, for example, early intervention or specification of statements or tribunals, whatever it is. You need to then look at that and drill down into that and scrutinise that and, and then ask, well, how are you going to baseline all of that and monitor your progress? And how are we going to know there's progress? Okay, that, that, that's useful, Rachel. Um, and this is going to be my final question because the members have asked you really good questions at this point. Um, uh, and some of, some of those were, were, were probably shared by me. You mentioned the UNCRC and the UNCRPD. So that, those are obviously, um, you've, you've indicated that we should be signed up to those fully. Uh, obviously, uh, Northern Ireland isn't uh, the only place that this would be, needed, should be signed up to those, and some, some, some uh, jurisdictions already are. Uh, special education needs aren't uh, synonymous to Northern Ireland, although we do have very high prevalences. Um, could, the, could you? Uh, either as Rachel or as CLT point to somewhere which is either good or best practice. Um, so whilst we're trying to redraw how we support uh, our children that have additional needs here in Northern Ireland, 
is there better practice and best practice? Is there good practice in other jurisdictions that we can draw from? And given the fact that Northern Ireland, I'm going to pick up something Daniel said, and I'm very, very passionate about this, the hypocrisy of politics in this country, political instability drive, drives everything down, whether it's economic, educational, or whatever. Um, the only nuance I think that we need to be considered of in terms of our approach is that there is still political instability by the nature of some of the politics in this country. So setting, trying to build that into good and better practice, are there, is there anywhere that is doing this so much better that we can nearly lift a blueprint from? Because I'm thinking, the final question would have been, what's the time frame for this look like? So if it's being done better, by who, where, and what, what, what can we lift? Yeah, uh, well, in terms of the time frame, this is going to take years. It's going to take years. There, there's this is not going to happen overnight. You know, having attended the the meetings where the various projects are being considered, the number of projects, the nature of the projects, I think we we'll have to be realistic and and realise that we want to do this right. We want to prioritise what needs to be prioritised urgently. The ones, the things that will impact children the most, um, in terms of positive impact, we want to get those done first, and and we're going to have to be realistic about that. In terms of uh, models of good practice, I think. It's actually fair to say the issues that we have in Northern Ireland are not remotely specific to Northern Ireland, although I think some of the compliance and governance issues are probably fairly unique to Northern Ireland, uh, or the evidence that we have about them, shall we say. We have the evidence now. Um, Scotland seems to be fairly progressive in terms of the children's rights uh, approach that it's ta it takes in terms of the UNCRC. I would go so far as to say Northern Ireland has been quite innovative. We have laws there. And we have the system and the framework there. So we have the Children's Services Cooperation Act, mm -hmm. which, uh, in a sort of a, a, in a sort of a way, incorporates the UNCRC into into our law in one way because well-being is measured against the UNCRC. So we have the tools there. The UNCRC and the UNCRPD, we have signed up to them, and we have the duty to implement them. They're not part of our domestic law, but they have gone into the um, Children's Services Cooperation Act. The 1996 uh, education order, as I say, is a robust rights-based framework. We'll have the SEND Act implementation coming in. That's a whole different session, and I have lots of issues around that. But there's the, there's the potential there to create a more inclusive education system. So I think we actually we have certain tools here. Of course, we could incorporate the UNCRC. The Children's Law Centre would be very happy with that, get that into primary legislation. Uh, but we can, look to the, we can look to other jurisdictions like like Scotland, our neighbours and people further afield for good practice. But we sort of did that during the SEM review. All of that was looked at. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We concluded that we pretty much just tinkered around the edges with our own legal system and added a few new legal rights. So let's use the law that's there to start with. Let's comply with it. And let's maximise its, its effect um, on children's rights in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Chair. That was really Thanks. good. Thanks, Thanks Robbie. Robbie. Rachel, really quick, um, something that read from me. What, how do we incorporate the uh, UNCRC in the domestic law of Northern Ireland Assembly and what would be the impact of us incorporating it? That's a very difficult last question to be asking somebody at the end of the session. <laughs> <laughs> so also you, not you my, it's also not my terrible policy way. expertise. I'll have to put my hands up. Um, but that that's something that we could definitely draw up paper on if it was thought to be useful, certainly. We have the expertise, I'm just not the relevant expert in relation okay. to that. No problem. It's, a, it's something that's been called for by yourselves and by the Children's Commissioner, so uh, I think we need to get our act together in that regard. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Thanks. Okay, we'll move to Nicola Brogan, MLA. Thank you, Chair and Rachel. Thanks so much for coming in this morning um, and uh, briefing us on this um, topic. It's been really insightful um, and informative um, discussion, so I really do thank you for that there. Um, I think you're a wonderful voice for children with special educational needs and for their families. Um, I just want to touch upon, firstly, um, the disability discri discrimination that you've um, already discussed, um, so through exclusion and restraint and seclusion, which has already been brought up as well. Um, the examples that you gave of um, exclusion specifically of children, you know, being sent home early um, or being excluded from plays and things like that there, um, so that is a form of seclusion. Um, um, 
I just, I, as Pat Jean's already said, we have heard testimony before from um, Deidre Shakespeare and Beth Morrison and the stories we heard were just awful. Um, so I think it's important to keep discussing that there to remind people these, this is still going on. Um, but I'd like to kind of have your views on how we combat that. I know last week we had um, Autism Men Ian who were talking about mandatory training, mandatory autism training for teachers and teaching staff. And, you know, we've often discussed the need for um, proper monitoring of incidents of restraint and seclusion and incident reporting. But can you think of any other ideas or how um, the Children's Law Centre would like to see um, things furthered so that we can combat this here? Yeah, in order to be able to combat a problem, you need to know what it is. And the very basic fact is that many school staff are not um, fully trained on disability law and equality but yet they are given the responsibility of ensuring that there is equality in their school. So when, when the Special Educational Needs and Disability Order came in in 2005, that was when it first became unlawful to discriminate against a child on the basis of disability within a school. It's hard to believe that now that it was only in 2005 that that came in. Um, so the policy came in, the inclusion policy came in, and more children with disabilities started to filter into mainstream schools. And with those children with disabilities, came the issues where, where disability equality hasn't been recognised. And we need to sort of stop and take stock of where our inclusion policy is. We've brought in a law, we've brought in protections, we obviously have human rights law and so on already there. Um, but have we equipped the people who are uh, working with the children every day to recognise discrimination? Because if people recognise discrimination and they understand it, they're not going to do it. They don't want to discriminate against disabled children. Nobody wants to discriminate against a disabled child. People generally want to do the right thing and do their job properly. So the very first thing is to equip them with knowledge and training. And that, that would be disability equality and human rights training. And it doesn't have to be rocket science. You know, I provided training like that before to organisations and to parents as part of our normal training calendar. And sometimes it's just giving those examples, the anecdotes, things that happen every day in the class and listening to lived experience, as this, the committee has been very good at doing, having people come in and go, look, this is what, how we felt or what happened to us uh, when I was excluded from school or when I couldn't be in the, the school play or when I was sent home early every day. So the first thing is education and educating children. I mean, it could be part of the school curriculum that children are taught about their human rights and disability rights and respecting others because... The children in the class who don't have disabilities are witnessing other children being treated in this way. And what is that teaching them? So we have to ask ourselves where our ethos and culture is. I think we also need to, to link up the work that the Department of Education and the EA are doing with the Department for Communities Disability Strategy. So there's a new disability strategy currently under a co-design process. Um, and I think education and inclusion and equality needs to be a big part of that. Um, so, you know, the disability strategy can set targets and priorities and there can be themes coming out of that that are related to inclusion in education. I think we need to, yes, talk about SEN. We're always talking about SEN, SEN, but we need to be talking about SEND, SEND, Special Educational Needs and Disability. And we need to always think about the child with disabilities. Now, the other point is we don't even know how many children in Northern Ireland have a disability. So again, we can't even pr provide services for those children. Although there are legal duties to register children with disabilities and count them on the health trusts under the children order, we don't do it. So every single policy that comes out of the government that affects disabled children is only able to comply with section 75 because there's no data on disability. So there's a very good starting point. Train people on disability equality and count children with disabilities so that you can monitor their experience. Thanks, Rachel. I think that's a really valid point you make that um, these examples of exclusion and restraint and seclusion, they're not intentional most of the time or, um, you know, it's just the fact that um, the people aren't trained. So I think that's a valid point. I'm going to move on to um, another topic you had raised in your opening remarks about the service needing to be properly funded, which I fully agree with. But there was um, a report from the audit office um, it said that despite a vast, vast sums of money being um, spent on SEND provision, 
that the Edu Education Authority and the department couldn't demonstrate value for money essentially. So can you give me an insight into the reality of that statement um, and then what the consequences are of that please? But the reason that they can't demonstrate value for money is because they don't have the data systems in place to evaluate um, the services. They don't even know how many children need the services. So although on paper money can look like a vast amount of money, it's only relative to the service it's providing and the number of people who need the service. So yes, it looks like a large figure on paper, but you need to relate that figure to the services that are being provided. So we really need a map of cost and a map of outcome and evaluation of the service. Um, my experience from working in this area is that there's not enough services there. Absolutely chronic shortage of services for children who need them. The schools have children queued up waiting for to go to an uh, educational psychology um, assessment. Um, and then you've got children, once they get through that, they still have to wait for a year or, or longer to get a service. And then when they get the service, it might be advisory in nature and not direct, or it might only be very time limited. So there needs to be a full scale review in relation to what are the costs, what's the money being spent on, and what, what is that uh, spend achieving in terms of outcomes for children? Because that's really all that matters at the end of it is what difference does it make? You can spend lots and lots and lots of money on a, a service, but if it, isn't, if it isn't any good and it's not providing the difference for children, then it's not worth the money. So, you know, I think. I assume and I hope that the Education Authority and the department are um, you know, reframing the way they collect management data so that they can actually report on what the service levels are. But again, I have to go back to the unmet need. We need to know what's needed and then we need to budget for that rather than just going, here's money, off you go. We need to know what is needed and then budget for that. And we need to do that in a long term way. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree, Rachel, and that, that's kind of the point. Um, it's not about the money, but it's how it's being used. Um, no, I agree with you there. That's all the questions for me, Rachel. Thanks so much for that, and thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Rachel. I think my overwhelming emotion now is one of sadness, deep sadness for what, what children are experiencing, what families are experiencing because of failures in our education system. It's, it's shockingly sad. And Rachel, where, where would we be without you? Where would families be? Where would those children be without the work you're doing and the work that the Law Children's Law Centre are doing? What would, what would, what would be the, the place of our kids without you? I suppose I worry about the children we don't have. Um, we're helping children that, that, that represent the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're representing the children whose parents have the wherewithal to come to us. Um, you know, some people have are equipped to to pick up the phone and ring ring the children's law centre. It's quite scary for a person sometimes to ring up and I'm ringing a lawyer. It's a free confidential service and it's we're very approachable, but people don't always know that. Um, and there are a number of services throughout Northern Ireland supporting a lot of these children with disabilities. But yeah, it's I I worry about the children and families out there who just haven't got the time, the energy or the ability, support that they need in order to ask for the help or to challenge us thoroughly. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's the 160% increase between 2015, 2016 to 2018, 2019. The two big parties were waving flags at each other. Children were being failed. It's so, so sad that was the case. And um, where, where does the book stop here, Rachel? Well, the accountability issue, um, you know, accountability starts with the leadership of an organisation and with the board, obviously, that controls and, and monitors that. And I know some of the, I, know the, I think it was the Public Accounts Committee report was critical of the, of the EA board um, because it didn't challenge the type of information that was being given. It didn't drill down into it and, and say, you know, I suppose there's a question there too. What information did it get, and why was it deficient, and uh, you know why was it not good enough? I think there's a, there's a an amount of investigation that has to go on to find out why we ended up in the position we were in, and I think I think again I go back to say this predates the education authority as well. This is not new. Um, our authorities have been behaving like this for a very long time. And the book yes. stops with all of us. We all have to, you know, raise the issues and seek accountability and challenge authorities when they get something wrong. 
and we've been doing that for years and years and years and I'm just really glad I know it's sad and I know it's awful and terrible to hear these stories but I'm really glad that it's all now out in the open it's out in the open the admissions are made no one's denying that any of this happened it's all out on the table and it's now time to try and build a solid foundation for a good service but as to the accountability that issue will not be for the children's law centre that'll be for others too to look at now yeah um you, you mentioned that just the deadline of the special education needs and disciplinary tribunals there's a vote fast from the education authority where they concede the last minute having put yeah. the family and the child through a long arduous process is that a policy well, we would have, we alleged um, in court proceedings that we took that we felt that it was purposefully being done to save money and to delay spend, but we weren't able to we weren't able to prove it, and um, the court didn't um, wasn't able to give us a ruling in relation to that, and the education uh, it was the education library board at the time denied it, but I have to say we were sitting in casework meetings every couple of weeks, and you know case would come towards us and you know you're reporting back to the colleagues what happened in the case and they nearly could write the notes before you said it case conceded case conceded statutory assessment being carried out and it's as you say i mean it is no small matter for a family an ordinary person out there in the street to pick up the phone to a tribunal and ask for a set of forms fill in formal legal proceedings start gathering documentation talking to everybody under the sun, phoning everybody for advice, gathering their paperwork together, putting their everything into doing a legal case, waiting to hear what the education authority is going to say about it, and then they get a phone call. We're going to carry out a statutory assessment. Now, the overwhelming reaction is going to be, oh, fantastic, that's great. And I'll always say to the parent, you won that case. Fair play to you for taking it and, and well done. But the reality is they've just spent months and months and months wasting their time in order to get the result that should have happened in the first instance. Um, so I think we, we need to really ask the question, you know, who was it that made these decisions and why was it that so many of them were wrongfully made and not based on evidence? Despite the fact that this was raised, I mean, we had a successful court case in 2015 where the, the court made a, the high court made a declaration of unlawfulness and warned boards at that time that if they failed to take into account parental evidence, they'd be acting unlawfully. And we didn't see any change from that time to now. Rachel, is, is that not institutional discrimination? Well, yes, that's part of it. Because if you don't provide the support that a child needs to access their education and they end up on part-time timetables and being treated differently than others, it all feeds into that, you know, that problem, which isn't just solely an EA problem. It's schools, it's parents, it's children, it's everybody involved. Um, but if you've got a system thank goodness we'll have the sandest thank goodness we'll have that because that is what i rely on every single day is the fact that i can point my parent to appeal rights if we didn't have that appeal right we would be completely lost sad it's very sad rachel well, thank god thank god for children's law center again in terms of the, the impact of the pandemic and um, i reached out to a special needs teacher and he's told me that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis children now are being Failed because of the pandemic, where they're not able to go to the PE hall, they're not able to go to the, the dinner hall, they can't go to the ball pool, they can't go to the sanctuary room. COVID has deprived the children of so much. How concerned are you about the impact of that, Rachel? Well, what COVID has not deprived children of is their legal rights in relation to disability discrimination. And I think it's very important to remember that. If people are behaving in a way that's causing disability discrimination, they need to be very careful about that because there's no modification to the law on disability discrimination. It applies in full. Um, where it would be affected was is that schools and others have to make reasonable adjustments and what is reasonable will vary from circumstance to circumstance. So some of the uh, aspects of the pandemic might, might make it reasonable to behave in a way now that wouldn't have been reasonable six months ago. However, the basic legal entitlement is there not to be treated less favourably than other children because you have a disability. Um, and that also involves proactive measures to make sure that you as a disabled child can participate in your education. Um, and ultimately, parents have the right to, to lodge disability discrimination claims against people who discriminate against their children in schools. And they can claim against the school and or the education authority if the failings are coming from its exercise of its functions. Um, you know, so the law is there and the legal rights are there. 
And if people know what their rights are, they can enforce them. And that's the, you know, the other thing is that if you neglect a child and you neglect their educational needs, that is the law of negligence. So if a child's education is maybe permanently harmed because of it, they have until the age of 21 to take a negligence action on the basis of educational negligence. So this is not without consequence. However, the harm is already done if that has happened and we don't want harm being done. We would need uh, steps to be taken to make sure the children's needs are met, that they know what their needs are and we identify those needs and then we meet them. There's the, the big piece, there are two big pieces to this, Rachel, I feel, and one's resource, obviously, and one is culture. Where, where do you think the emphasis needs to be on? It's, you know, we all have to play our part. There's, there is responsibility on all of us to play our part in this. Is culture the biggest piece here, which is the hardest thing to, to manoeuvre or change? I think culture is definitely a very, very important aspect of it, culture and ethos. And that's something I think the disability strategy might have the ability to tackle at some level is that culture and ethos and attitude problems um, that people with disability, all people with disabilities face on a daily basis and the barriers that they have in just everyday life, things that we take for granted. You know, our society is putting barriers in the way of people with disabilities that prevents them from being full participants, full participants in their everyday life. And we need to be looking at how we remove those barriers, and that includes within the education system. We need to make our education system more friendly and inclusive for children uh, with disabilities, more accessible. That's what accessibility planning duties are about. All schools should have accessibility plans. Now, you can only make an accessibility plan if you've got space, time, resource, budget to do it. But culture and ethos goes a very, very long way. Can-do attitude goes a very, very long way. So in the absence of resources, obviously, in any event, the first port of call is culture, ethos and attitude. Well, here you've played a major part in hopefully changing that culture, Rachel. So thank you. You truly are a children's champion. So well done for your continued really, really important work. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Rachel. Thanks, Justin. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA? Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, Rachel. Rachel, thank you very much for your, your detailed presentation. Uh, very, very, uh, very interesting and very concerning, I, I can kind of say. Uh, during your presentation, you alluded to success, success rate that you've had through the courts and also that recommendations have been made following those successful court appearances. What have been the outcomes of those recommendations and what changes have been accomplished following those recommendations, if any? Well, this has been one of, the, one of the big disappointments in a sense that thinking of the statutory assessment issue, um, it's extremely difficult to get a successful judgment. I mean, you have to have really salient facts, very strong evidence uh, in order for a judge to declare that a public authority has acted unlawfully. You have to have really cogent evidence. Um, and of course, the public authority will put up the fight for their life because they don't want the declaration made against them. Uh, and Mr. Justice Horner did make such a declaration in 2015. And it was an issue that we've been trying to tackle for years. We were obviously absolutely delighted. It was recognized. And we, we use this judgment all the time in negotiations, in legal proceedings, in policy responses that, um, you know, you have got to give the parental evidence the weight that it deserves. Evidence is evidence regardless of which source and it all has to be treated accordingly and given appropriate credibility according to its, according to its source um, and the content of it. So we would have expected that following such a declaration that the, the practice would change and we'd start to see less of these types of cases where statutory assessments were being refused. But I mean, they're still happening to this day, Morris. I mean, I'm still contacting. I mean, recently I contacted the Education Authority. I drafted an appeal in a case and I said to myself, I'm fed up filing these appeals. I'm going to just send this to the Education Authority and go, do we really need to have an appeal about this? You know, could you look at this situation? And in fairness, they did. And, and it was resolved and a statutory assessment did take place. But that's only because that parent came to me and I had a contact on the Education Authority in relation to saying improvement, who I contacted about it. Um, I have no idea how many statutory assessment refusals there have been that have gone unchallenged and which were unlawful. I hazard a guess it's a large number. So the practices have not changed. 
there's a real arrogance in relation to the way that the education authority and the boards before it just went on with their legal non-compliance because and the reason they did it was because they got away with it for years and years and years and they probably justified it you know we don't have the money we have to stem the, the flow of these uh, cases coming through we need to keep the numbers down we don't have the budget so the accountability goes all the way up um, and the system the system has been completely exposed and i'm very thankful for that because it means that we can start to put it right hopefully but we need to we need to continue with the external scrutiny for a very long period of time as well. Yeah, so Victor, it's disappointing that the changes that have been recommended uh, haven't really been followed up on. Uh, we also made, made uh, reference to children with special needs, and I, I think children with special needs have particularly suffered during COVID nineteen, especially the education routine and patterns. Uh, as we are hopefully returning to some sort of normality and, and children return to education, which is difficult enough, I would imagine children with special needs may find it even more difficult to integrate into full time learning again. So, what would your recommendations be to the education authority to fully integrate SEN pupils and pupils with disabilities back into full time education? Yeah, largely on a practical Sorry. Sorry. Ahead, yeah, yeah. Largely on, on a practical level, that's going to come down to schools. So schools mm -hmm. are at the cold face, welcoming the children in the front door. And I think what will have to happen is that some children, it will become apparent that they need to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. So the provision that's in place for them that they traditionally had, once it starts to operate normally again, which I sincerely hope it will start to do very soon if it hasn't already, if that provision, it turns out, uh, isn't now meeting the child's needs or they're not coping, then those children will need to be reviewed to see what additional support that they individually require. Um, now, there's general things that schools and education authorities can do, and I know there are various programmes that are being funded, um, such as in, Engage and, and things like that, to try and put money into schools to enable them to tailor programmes for children and welcome that. Um, but ultimately, we might need to have additional resource available to make increased SEM presentation in short term. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would anticipate that that will be the case. Yeah, well, listen, Rachel, you rightly answered the other part of the question. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. But I just I have a, a concern that some people uh, may have regressed uh, during the COVID layoff uh, and lockdown. So, uh, thanks for your answer. You also highlighted uh, systemic operational failures following the merger of the five education boards and the World Education Authority. Would you agree that a root and branch reform of the Education Authority itself? Uh, including special education needs and children with disabilities is urgently required. And what would your main recommendations be that we should take from this presentation of yours this morning? Yeah, I think, you know, we're looking at, it's more than improvement, as you say. Improvement is when you're starting from a base where you've got a level of legal compliance and you've got a starting point. We're having to go right, right down to the foundations of the education authority here and nearly rebuild it from the bottom up, is my view on it. Um, you know, there was a point when I had very little optimism left and I would have just have said, we just need to start again, this isn't working. But actually now when I've seen um, some of the efforts that have been made, it has given me more optimism. Um, but, you know, there's always that cynical voice that I'll, I'll keep in the back of my mind and I'll always scrutinise now and challenge. But I think um, it is going to take root and branch reform from, from the ground all the way up to the top. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the culture and ethos comes from the leadership and if you've got good leadership and good management, that should also filter down. And I think I think the openness and transparency are the, are the two main things that we need to see going forward. Uh, and no more no more doctoring of um, numbers, no more hiding problems. Uh, the education authority should be able to speak up and say, you know, which I was surprised they didn't at an earlier point. We don't have enough money to do this or we don't have enough, whatever it is, resource we need, or specialism or expertise, or we don't have the, the business uh, the business organization or the management skills to do this, we need you know extra stuff brought in. They need to be able to escalate it up outside themselves if they can't manage. And they need to have to be able to do that without being criticized. You know, it's easy to criticize. It's harder to encourage and support you know, to make change and improvement. I think there has to be a level of support and encouragement given because it's a very hard task ahead and we want it to be successful. I'll, I'll, I'll let you come back in again more find another point, but that, that's the thing that always that I couldn't understand either. I, that I've, I was on this committee in 2016. I, I recall 
education authority personnel, Department of Education personnel sitting in front of us of our committee and us asking them, hey, are there resource issues? Are there, you know, the other issues that you um, suggested? And they just they just weren't raised. And then as you've also alluded to, they were they weren't picked up adequately by the education authority board either. There you are, sorry, Mark. Cut across there. Do you want a final comment and then we need to move on? Yeah, Chair, that will be just a comment. I think that the, the merger of the five boards and any bad practices that may have uh, been in place within the five boards was amplified going into uh, a joint authority, and that's the problem. We didn't deal with it at the very start, and uh, that's all I, I will say in that in the meantime, Chair. Thank you very much for your patience. Thanks, Morris. Rachel, thank you. Um, we obviously have the Education Authority with us in our next session, so I want to make sure we leave enough time for that. But can I say a very sincere thanks to you for your uh, evidence today, uh, and as I said, for your, your long-standing um, record of work on this issue and, and of work with MLAs across uh, many different fora on these issues as well. Um, and we'll hopefully stay in touch with you to make sure that we see uh, support the scrutiny of these reforms through. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Clark, do, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring members back into the spotlight briefly and ask the Clark to summarise any actions resulting from that briefing? Yes, Chair, um, as I said, a lot of this is uh, germane to the next session with the EA. Um, but I will just briefly recap on some of the main points, um, and some of them may uh, the committee may wish to refer to the department um, after the second session has been completed. Um, so uh, the Children's Law Centre um, are involved in the new reform process that has been um, instituted, um, and uh, Rachel said she was relatively impressed by the urgency and will. Um, from the new chief executive down. That being said, then um, in terms of early engagement, um, there are there's a need to have early interventions put into place. They're proven, they're essential. Um, why is this not being done? Um, the main point that kept coming out through the session was that the EA is not making um, its decisions based on evidence. And then there's a concern that um, with the high level of um, appeals being found in favour of parents. You know, what is the reason for this? Is it a policy? Is it a cultural issue? Is it an unspoken um, resourcing, um, you know, attempt to economise? Um, Rachel also said it, there was a need to send out a strong message that parents are the experts when it comes to their own children. Um, and um, again, then issues that the committee has been interested in in terms of. Uh, uh, Restraint and seclusion um, and mandatory training came over quite strongly. So, um, basic behaviours that can be recognisable with with um, with basic training um, training needs to be rolled out. Um, there needs to be coherence across government departments and um, in the approach to children's legal rights. Um, and also, uh, in terms of the understanding of human rights. Um, disability uh, legislation, the need for public services not to disable a child um, by not affording it um, the right conditions um, for education. Um, transparency came up as well, um, unmet need, um, particularly of uh, children with statements um, being excluded from school, excluded from participation because proper arrangements haven't been set up. Um, so. By and large, um, Rachel felt that you know there was a move in the right direction as a result of these critical reports that have come out, um, and that there's a wonderful opportunity here to be um, to make Northern Ireland a gold standard in this respect. And um, so that's just to recap. Um, okay. we'll come back then at the end of the second session, if that's okay. Yep. Can I? I mean, the, the core issue that keeps arising is an independent inquiry, an independent review of special educational needs. Members are content if we write to the Education Minister to ask if there will be an independent uh, inquiry of special educational needs. Content, Chair, uh, yes. Chair, sure, uh, yeah. so only say it might be appropriate to wait until after the next session before deciding on that. 
Happy to, happy to defer that to the end of the next session. We'll come back to that then. Okay, members will move into agenda item six then, our oral briefing from the Education Authority on special educational needs. I can ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add the witnesses. Can I refer members to a briefing note from the Committee Park at page 132? A briefing paper from the Education Authority at 135. And table today is the Department of Education's response to the PHC report on special educational needs. This has just been published, and the Public Accounts Committee will, of course, deal with this in detail. But for our purposes today, we should note that the Department has accepted all of the Committee's recommendations. Can I welcome then Sarah Long, the Chief Executive of the Education Authority, Dina Turbot, Interim Director of Children and Young People Services, and if you're still Interim Director, Una, that you may clarify that for us. It uh, seems like you've been working hard at that for a while now. Um, Cynthia Curry, Assistant Director of Children and Young People Services at the Education Authority. Can I advise witnesses that you will have 10 minutes to make an opening statement? And then we'll take questions from the members. I don't know if you heard um, our last evidence session, but um, th there remain some serious challenges in relation to special educational needs, um, to say the least. So we look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I want to begin by saying that I have been before this committee. I have only ever been open, honest and transparent with this committee. I have acknowledged the issues that we have faced in special educational needs, I have apologised for them, and we have now embarked on our programme of improvement. I want to say that from the outset. When I last appeared before the committee in September, our education system was emerging from lockdown and restart plans were being implemented. Seven months later, we are in a similar position and again, I think it is very important for me to take this opportunity to thank the entire education workforce for their exceptional commitment and the immense effort that they continue to show to support our children and young people and ensure a safe and successful return to school for all. Although important lessons were learned from the first lockdown, considerable additional challenges have had to be overcome this time. Broader provision of the curriculum and support services through remote and blended approaches, post-primary transfer processes, preparations for centre assessed grading and special schools have had to remain open throughout. The demands have been formidable, but our teaching and non-teaching staff have once again risen to the challenge. Regardless of the additional pressures that COVID has created, I have continued to drive forward the special educational needs change agenda over the last six months. As you know, in early 2020, I tasked EA officers with establishing a statutory assessment improvement project, and by September, good progress was being made. That project has continued to deliver results, and I am very pleased to report to you that as of the 31st of March 2021, no child in Northern Ireland had been waiting more than 26 weeks for their statutory assessment to be completed. This is only one of the project's impacts, but it is an important one for our children and families. And I am very proud of my team's efforts and their achievement. In November 2019, there were over 1,000 children who had been waiting more than 26 weeks. And reducing that figure to zero, whilst also dealing with COVID, displays real commitment, tenacity and enthusiasm on my staff's part, and I thank them for it. We have shown what can be achieved with the right focus, and I also acknowledge that there is still more that needs to be achieved. Not just within statutory assessment, but right across the SEND system. We still face more than 150 recommendations for change across numerous scrutiny reports, including now the recommendations of the February 2021 PAC report, and we will work with DE to implement those. SEND Act implementation also continues. A significant ongoing programme of work is underway. 
As I reported to you in September, in partnership with the Department of Education and the Department of Health, we have established a single cross-sectoral programme to coordinate the entire SEND change agenda across Northern Ireland. I personally chair the board of the SEND Strategic Development Programme, which continues to meet regularly, and 15 key programmes of work have been identified. The programme board is also advised by a standing stakeholder reference group. This is chaired by Dr Ray Nethercott, a consultant paediatrician, and it is made up of community, voluntary and sectoral partners. This group has and will continue to be central to developing a meaningful co-design programme process for the programme. We've also had initial engagement with more than 300 school leaders on the process and a further round of practitioner engagement events is being scheduled for June. Wider engagement with parents, children and young people is also underway, all of which will lead to the submission of a costed programme proposal to the Education Minister by the end of this academic year. The programme concept has been received positively by stakeholders to date and I am confident that we have begun the right road to transforming Northern Ireland's SEND system in a sustainable and child-centred way over the coming months and years. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Sarah. And uh, obviously we welcome improvements uh, that have been made in relation to the waiting times for the statutory assessment uh, of Special Educational Needs Award, although as previous contributor has said, we shouldn't be too um, congratulatory in relation to lawful compliance um, with timescales in relation to helping children with disabilities. Um, it, it shows how far away from uh, meeting those needs that we actually were previously. Um, I don't think I appreciate your your, your opening remarks uh, in relation to um, openness, transparency, uh, and previous apologies given. Um, you, I think we've engaged respectfully and constructively constructively with you, even when we've had difficult questions uh, and difficult um, statements to put to you. The, the Education Committee has heard today that the extent to which children and families with special educational needs have been failed by our educational system amounts to institutionalised discrimination against children with disabilities. How would you react to that statement? I think, Chair, um, as I've said, we, we have acknowledged the work that we have to do and we have acknowledged um, uh, the significant programme of work that needs to be undertaken. I don't think that it is for the Education Authority alone um, to undertake this reform, and that's why our programme approach and our programme board um, includes cross-sectoral uh, working, cross-departmental working. I think it's something that we all need to put our full weight behind, and it's something certainly as an organisation we have put our full weight behind. So acknowledging the work that needs to be done, but we are embarking on that work now and we have a very clear improvement plan around that. I think I would also say, Chair, that I don't believe the improvement plan will be short term. It will take us time. There are things that we can do right here and right now in the short term that we must do. For example, as you've referenced yourself um, in terms of our own legislative compliance and some of those very clear things that, that, that are, are incumbent upon us to do. But I think some of our systemic change and some of that cultural change that has been described will take place over time. Um, we are committed to that. We are organisationally committed to that. And we've put our full organisational support behind that. OK. So have children with disabilities in Northern Ireland been institutionally discriminated? I'm not sure that that's the terminology that I would use. No, what I would say is, and I've said before, they have been failed and we can do better and we should do better and we will do better. Um, I'm not okay. sure that institutional discrimination is the term that I would use. Okay, and the extent of the feeling, does that require a, an independent review of all statutory operations? We've heard this morning that that is necessary or there is a risk that that will infect any new SEM framework. 
the recommendation of the PAC report, I, I believe recommendation two of the PAC report, um, asks specifically for such a review of SEN services, and that has been accepted by the department. So we will work with the department in whatever way they choose in order to bring that recommendation forward. Okay. And um, can I also ask why, according to data that we've been presented with today, almost 100% of appeals of the EA decision making and statutory assessments of special educational needs are being upheld against the EA. Okay, Chair, I will ask Cynthia to speak in more detail on this. What I would say on the outset is that you will recall that that was a key area that was identified in the EA's audit of practice um, that we brought before the committee in March of 2020. So that was something that was um, identified and picked up as part of our programme of work. It's also one of our key 15 projects we've identified in terms of taking that work forward and continuing with it. So we're very clear that that is a, is a key area that we need to uh, focus on. And it was drawn out in that audit of practice um, from 2020. But Cynthia, maybe you want to talk about um, just yeah. some of the, the details surrounding what we've been doing and also just some of the numbers as they are now. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, it absolutely has been an aspect. It, as Sarah said, it was um, very clearly uh, one of the outworkings of the audit of practice. And for us in the last year, the important thing is what, that we need to understand um, why parents were needing to go to send us appeal. And therefore, we needed to understand how we could improve practice to make sure that parents didn't have to go through that. Clearly, that's a very difficult route for a a parent to decide to do. So um, alongside our, our legal teams and alongside the statutory operations teams and indeed speaking with parents and, uh, who have gone through this very process, um, we tried to understand why things had happened. So first of all, there were um, there were cases taken because of backlog and clearly we have been looking at that and working on delays. The other aspect was in relation to some of the decision making in the statutory assessment panel. And we have been looking at how we make those decisions. And one of the things that I suppose was very clear in the past, and, and we, we, we have challenged, was that um, stage three services, uh, by the nature of progression um, of a child with special educational needs, should be exhausted before coming to statutory assessment. Um, and what I think maybe perhaps wasn't recognised as much was that in some local areas, the stage three services need to be better. And therefore, it was difficult for parents to actually exhaust the stage three services. And I think the, the um, programme clearly calls out a few of the projects um, in relation to that. One is about looking at our stage three services. Another is about looking at early intervention so that we can make sure that in any place in Northern Ireland that you're in, that you will have access to those services. And I've no doubt that um, when we cost up the programme, there will be resources required there. Um, it also was about looking at the information coming through for, to, for statutory assessment to make their decisions. So they do have a provisional criteria, um, which um, I, I suppose is a fairly dated document now, but we have opportunity with the SEND Act and with the new Code of Practice and Regulations to review that. And part of our uh, programme will be to review that provisional criteria, and that will need a lot of engagement and thought. But it also was looking at the information that we come through, uh, come through to the panel. So, for example, schools can refer, but also parents can refer. And that's really important that we have that referral route because nobody knows a child better uh, than, the, than the parent. But sometimes when parents, I suppose, go down that route, perhaps the information that they have or potentially the ability to give or even to know what they, they, they need to give um, is limited and it's difficult to make those decisions and therefore um, you know we have to go back and, and, and ask for more information. So what we're about to launch next month to try to help that is an online referral uh, form and I do think this is going to be a game changer for parents and other professionals who are uh, referring for statutory assessment because it talks them through the type of things 
things that they need and key questions that they can help to answer about their child. And that has a, a help button, if you like, on that, where they can, at that early stage, have the conversation about their child. And I've also no doubt, and we have done some work on this, that it is about training and it is making sure the right structures are in place for decision making. It's better working across services, so statutory operations are not the only people who make decisions. This is a, a educational psychology are also involved in our statutory assessment panels. So a lot of work has gone on, but this is an area that, as you can see, is not closed off in our actions. It's one of the areas that we continue to have from statutory operations going into uh, the, the programme. Uh, Chair, that is probably a long-winded answer. My apologies, but there has been a lot of work that has gone in to try to recognise how we can improve uh, the system and be proactive in, uh, in improving that. Okay, uh, well, yeah, welcome that information. But what I mean, what responsibility does the the education authority take for a almost one hundred percent education authority failure rate on appeals in relation to statutory assessments? I mean, I'm not, I would absolutely not say it's a, a statistic that I welcome being here today and looking at, but it's not one that we have hidden and it's not one that we haven't, I suppose PAC has uh, highlighted this, others have highlighted this, we are challenging this and we really do hope that that is something that will change as we change the bigger picture, but it's not an easy fix, Chair without okay. affecting all the parts of the system. Okay. Yeah. I mean, put Justice that he is producing unlawful statutory assessments and statement content. Is a conclusion to draw from that, Peter? Rate? Statement content could be one aspect, and statement content is an aspect that we are looking at. You'll see quality of statements is one of the other areas that we are looking at. We need to look at it because of the new SEND Act, so there are new regulations coming in which will require us to look at the template and the format and what goes into statements. So that is one element of SEND to appeal, but it is only one element, Chair, and there are so many elements to that one area within okay. the special. Okay, and, and are, are devices being used, approaches being used to dilute content and specificity of statements of special educational needs? Absolutely not. That is not the intention to dilute or to undermine um, any of the, the authority there to make um, uh, statements, uh, I suppose, less effective. In, abs in actual fact, we need to absolutely look at the statements and make sure that there's early engagement with parents, that they're happy with the statement, but also that they understand it. Our statutory processes are such that the language around them is too difficult for many parents to understand, and that is absolutely something that needs to change. And we, and we have not hidden from the fact, Chair, that this is a journey that we are on and we are changing and actually learning the lessons of cases and learning from the stories of parents will help us on that journey and we do welcome those. Okay, okay. and are you, you mentioned engagement earlier, are you engaging with experts like Rachel Hogan at the Children's Law Centre on improving this unacceptable failure rate? The, the door is open, uh, Chair. Um, I think we've all made very clear that the door is open uh, for people to, to come to us. We will accept any help, absolutely. It's a big task ahead. We have our programme, as you know, our programme approach, and that programme approach has a reference group. Rachel Hogan is one of the people on that reference group, and therefore any of the changes that are coming through are coming through for engagement. We're also engaging with school practitioners, there are opportunities, we're, we're carving out opportunities uh, to talk to parents. So that's a two-way street. It's first of all us taking our, uh, I suppose, taking our plans and showing uh, quality assuring them with lots of uh, partners, but it's also an open door where there, if there are issues, uh, Nikki, Children's Law Centre, other very constructive partners can come to us with those and, and um, the door is open. 
Okay, and a, a bigger question here, I guess, but one, one that has to be asked, and I suppose that we have asked before, but who, how did we get to this situation and who who is accountable? Who, who is going to be held accountable for the extent of the systemic failure in special educational needs? I think, Chair, how did we get to this situation? Um, I, I, I heard Rachel say this is a situation that's been ongoing for some time. Um, and I think there's a lot, as Cynthia says, of lessons learned along the way that we now have to apply. Um, I think it's definitely focused on Ultimately, I am the chief executive. I am accountable for the performance of these services, um, and I am determined that we will improve those services. Um, and again, I, I, I state that we are, we are on our journey. We are, we are underway, and we are improvement focused and wanting to move forward. I, I to be fair to you, sir, I, I don't think too many people doubt that, and maybe it's not a fair question to ask of you, and I'm conscious of times that we have you as officers in, and not chairs and uh, members of the board of the Education Authority, but I think it is a question that continues to hang in the air, and I know that there were ongoing processes to which that we couldn't refer, but I, I think there is a significant unanswered question with regards to who is accountable for these feelings. Um, we can we can come back to that. My, my final question, I think it's my final question, area planning and saying school places. We encountered unacceptable chaos last year. What plans are in place to address any shortfall in places for September 2021? Okay, Chair, I'll ask Una to pick up on some of the detail then around our planning for September in 2021. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we're well aware last year was a very difficult year because we came to it late um, in that we were dealing with um, uh, 285 children at the end of June last year um, requiring places that um, hadn't been aligned. So we, we have taken the learning from that. Um, we have set up um, a cross-functional team um, across the EA, so cross-directorate team um, that's meeting now on a, on a weekly basis to address this issue. It's a corporate priority and it's on our risk register um, and we are getting the full support of our corporate leadership team in order to implement this. We're working um, on a weekly basis. That team are actually reporting to the relevant directors on a weekly basis and at that meeting we also have DA um, representation on that, um, on that, at that meeting. We're also um, managing it through a risk assessment process. So we've identified where our key risks are. For example, our procurement in terms of additional um, resources that are required, human resources, locations, minor works, compliance with legislation. So we're taking um, a risk management approach to it. We also um, have now, as opposed to last year, where we were approaching 21 different um, education officers to ask them for information from their caseloads, we have actually directed resource to this. So we have um, a, a specialist um, uh, officer who has a, a background in logistics and also one who has joined the team in relation to data analysis and, and, and an IT program. So we now have a database that actually allows us to analyse the demand against individual um, children against their BT codes, against their ages, their their phases, um, and their prefer their parental preferences when they um, when they come to us. Um, we started off, I suppose, looking at what we were predicting to be where the demand was and where the pressures are. Some of that's based on last year's information, so we know the Greater Belfast area, Cookstown, South Down um, areas were areas that we were really struggling to get placements. We now know that Carrick Fergus is another is an additional area um, where we where we have where we have particular pressures. So we're using our data, we're using our information, and we're using our relationships with schools and principals to identify where the demand is and also where the physical capacity is within within schools um, to allow us to set up additional provisions. Um, it is it is not without challenge. Um, you know we have set ourselves a target that all children will be place in appropriate provision by September, but we know that's stretching. Um, so we we have a we have a significant journey to go and that is why this is a, this is on our risk 
register. Um, yeah. But we are determined to work uh, with with our special school principals and with our, our principals, particularly in those areas where we have pressures, um, to make sure that we are identifying and building the capacity. Um, huge operation, minor works. There's a lot. To, there's a lot to be done um, to achieve this. Um, but we know the number of children that need that need to be placed. Uh, we're in a better. We are in a in a, in a better place. So, I, mean, I feel that I'm in a better place than I was um, last year. Um, albeit that there is a growing number of children who need to be placed. So this is a, the number of children need to be placed. We know has been growing year on year, and this year is no different. So the demand continues to grow, um, and we will continue to respond to it. This will be our. This is our our, our absolute priority business. Okay. Uh, when when will you know how many? Uh unplaced children you have? Well, we know at the minute um, we have roughly, uh, you know, we've over 4,200 children who need to be to be placed. Um, we know that of those over 1,100 children require a special school place. Um, already we have 480 children, 88 children who are actually placed already because we know where they are in the case of transferring them from one place and it's fairly obvious where, they, where those children will go. I think it's going to take us another month to work through the detail because we are dependent on parental preferences coming in. We 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 can predict where 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 children might go, but it's interesting because whilst we may feel and and psychology assessments might recommend a special school place, parent parental preference might say I prefer my child to be in a mainstream school, either in a specialist provision or. Um, so we have to work with parents, um, and as well as that, the the numbers will continue to grow because the statement process doesn't stop and uh, we're continuing to get children coming through the system. But I feel we're in a much better place. We're in more control of our of our of our information. We know what our risks are and we are working through um, with an implementation plan with with the intention of having children in place and if not for a small number of children contingencies um, um, for the, for those for those who um, haven't been placed by August. Okay. So, Thank you. And I, I think it would be worth me putting on the record that I've worked with you on a on an individual MLA basis on on some of those issues, and I I, I thank you for the, the the commitment that you've shown to dealing with a, a significant problem. I'd be grateful if you could keep the committee up to date with progress on on that particular issue. It'd be great. Final final okay. question. If you can give me a short answer, I need to bring other members in. Why ha, what has the additional special school for Belfast recommended in 2012 yet to be delivered? Um, I, sir, do you want to take that one? That is an area planning issue which is being dealt with through the education um, directorate. Yeah, it is an area planning issue, Chair. Um, we have the area planning consultation framework out. As you know, it's just closed, actually. It closed on the 12th of April, um, and that's something that we would like to see taken forward through that framework now. Um, I think it's been very important that we have taken the time to consult fully um, on that framework and, and meaningfully as well. Um, and that's something that we would like to see come forward from that um, and that we could move forward with it. Okay, could ask more there, but I'll bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Chain, MLA, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, ladies. Um, I, I'm sure you listened to the contribution from the representative of the Children's Law Centre uh, who was in for you. And uh, she did comment positively, Sarah, about your contribution since she came in the post. However, overall, she gave an absolutely withering critique of the Education Authority's performance in, in terms of the delivery of special education and disability support for children in, in our schools. Uh, and just to run through a few of the things that she commented on, there was a lack of specification and statements, uh, records altered and backdated, uh, problem, problems of culture and ethos within the Education Authority, children not having Additional needs met, as well as educational needs, there was need to provide speech or occupational therapy uh, that wasn't uh, being met. And uh, perhaps the most worrying thing was the ignoring of evidence. And this is despite Justice Horner's uh, judgment some time ago, that weight 
should be given to parental evidence. And I suppose the most damning comment that Rachel made in her evidence was that the education authority are ignoring the evidence and that's why they're losing 97% of cases that go to send this tribunal. So would you like to comment on that? Yes, absolutely. Um, Chair, I'll start and I'll ask Una and Cynthia to come in. I think as Cynthia has mentioned earlier, Children's Law Centre are on our programme reference group, so they will be aware of all of the actions that we are undertaking to address um, all of the issues that you've outlined there. Um, I think Cynthia's picked up earlier on the lack of specification in statements and the quality of statements and the work that we're doing in that but I'll ask her to address it again. In terms of, of statements backdated, etc., that was a key finding of our audit and practice, of our audit and practice that took place in, in November 2019, and we reported to the committee in March 2020. And you'll see from your update that we've done extensive work in that area, and that is not something that we believe is an issue anymore. And certainly, when we move to our online referral form, we will have an electronic record of all of that. Um, in relation to ignoring the evidence from parents, again, I think Cynthia has attempted to address that. We are, we are learning the lessons from our cases, from our parental stories. We believe very strongly in the voice of the parent, and we believe very strongly in the voice of the parent and the co-design of the reforms that we're doing. Hence, the weight that we have attached to that programme reference group and to the parental... Uh, sorry, Sarah, could I just uh, cut in on you there? I apologise for stopping your flow there. But Rachel actually gave one example of where evidence had been provided by the parent, by the school, and uh, medical evidence and reports were also included, uh, and a statutory assessment was refused. Uh, and it was only by chance the parent actually contacted the Children's Law Centre, and Sir, or sorry, Rachel was then able to take up the case. And of course, that was one at the at the appeal stage. But why could you explain? And I mean, Cynthia talked a lot about the processes, but if the evidence is is being ignored, and in that case, uh, the evidence was compelling, how you know? How, can you explain to us and to the ordinary man and woman in the street how on earth evidence like that wasn't taken into account? Well, obviously, I, d I don't know what the individual case was, and, and I can't comment on the particular evidence in that case. I'm not asking you to comment on the individual case, sir. Yeah, I think overall, I think what we're saying is that we... We know we need to get better at listening to parents and we've tried to put our processes in place to do that. Um, we're very clear that we do need to make evidence-based decisions and we're very clear that we need to change the outcome of, of, of tribunal appeals. But I think as Cynthia tried to describe, we can't just do that by doing one thing. We have to do that by doing a number of things. Um, and that will include the work that we're doing around the culture and the ethos of the team, but it's also around our own systems and processes and, and, and how we improve those. So it's not a single thing, it's multiple things. And we have a programme of work ongoing around trying to attend to those multiple things and it is our hope or, or our plan maybe I should say that we'll start to see the outworkings of those in in those appeals that, that that will cease to be the case that as we get better at what we're doing we'll start to see that manifest itself through the appeals process. Cynthia I don't know if you want to say any more and I don't know if I've described that particularly well. I don't think any more than, than what we have and but I just, I suppose I, I would uh, pick up, um, remember that, uh, you know, I have described the processes, but I'm very clear that children are at the centre. Um, so I would definitely have that on record. I've had it on record many, many times. And we are not, we want children to get support as early as they can. We want children to be supported. Um, and that is why we need the processes in place to be able to do that. But I have no doubt that children and families are at the centre of this and need to be at the centre of it. But um, nothing, nothing further to add at this point, Sarah. Chair, do you mind if I, if I just add something to this? Because uh, this is something that we talk about a lot whenever we're out engaging with our teams. Um, we talk about taking the fight 
out of this process and that's something we have referred to um, in the past and we are very conscious that parents talk about their fight to get what they believe their children need and want. Um, as part of this process we, we are building our engagement with, with parents. We have been very clear with our, our officers that they need to work through their relationships with parents and also as an extra layer to that where parents are not are not feeling that they are heard we've set up an independent helpline so that's chaired by two two specialist teachers with special educational needs provisions and um, they man on that phone with the, with the support of the team and they provide independent support of the, of the actual officers who are involved in the case and the idea behind that is to help parents work through this process and help everyone to understand what it is that we can do to support them to get the provision that the children need. And I'm going to be very honest here. We do have challenging conversations with parents. Um, and sometimes I feel that is because of the lack of confidence in the provision that's out there in schools. Um, some of it's to do because it, some of it's to do with not having enough early intervention and 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 support within the school setting itself. Um, and therefore they believe that the only option um, available to, to them to keep their children safe in school and to help their children to learn through a full-time classroom assistant. Um, so we need to work through that and this has to be looked at within the whole context of improving and transforming the same services that are available to all children and, and families so that their rights are um, respected in relation to their educational attainment. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, but. You know, I've heard you saying, sir, we have to listen more to parents. And Duna has said uh, we're building engagement with parents. At the end of the day, um, the representative from the Children's Law Centre, when asked, you know, what could the EA do? What's the most important thing they could do to try and resolve some of these problems? The answer was they need to look at the evidence. Now, you can talk all you want about having engagement with parents uh, or talking more to parents or whatever. But if you are, and the term that was used by Rachel Hogan was that the EA are ignoring the evidence. And that's why the number of cases going to uh, tribunal end up with 97% being lost by the education authority. So, uh, I mean, could could I suggest that you engage as a matter of urgency with the Children's Law Centre around this particular issue? Now, I, and, and, and just on the same issue, uh, you, you said at the outset, Sarah, in your opening uh, commentary, that um, all children now are being assessed within 26 weeks. Did I, did I pick you up right on that? Yes, at the 31st of March, no child had been waiting longer than 26 weeks for their assessment. And how many assessments had been turned down in that same period? I don't know, is the honest answer. I don't have that with me. I'll, have, I'll get that detail and I'll, I'll get it back through the clerk. You see, when, when we hear statistics being presented, well, I, I often wonder, has there been a change in the way... Uh, uh, statistics are being data is being produced, or have uh, figures been massaged in some way? So, if there's an increase in the number of assessments that are being refused, that could have an impact on the ability to ensure that other assessments are being carried out within the twenty uh, within the twenty six week period. Um, so I would like to I would like to, to to hear those figures if you can get them for me at some stage. And Absolutely. Well, I would say from the from the outset, it has never been our intention that we would refuse more children so that we could meet our statutory compliance. It has been our intention from the outset of this program that we would improve that process for 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 parents and for children, and that is what we and the teams had set about to do over the course of this year. So it has never been our intention to manipulate or massage or to um, to refuse statements so that we could improve our performance. And I think in terms of the number of assessments that are complete that are within the briefing paper, I think that's that, that's probably there to be seen. 
and okay. we thought they need, need to move us on, Pat. Okay, thanks. Just one final one, uh, Chris, a quick one. Um, we 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 hear that there is a problem of of culture and ethos within the EA. So, Sarah, can you tell us what plans you have put in place to bring about significant changes there? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, we we have done significant work in terms of the culture and the ethos of, of us as an organisation and in terms of our, our values and staff living our values. So we've done significant work through our senior leadership team with that, our values into action programme, as, as we call it. And it's a key part of all our organisational development and learning um, and, and very much around modelling our values and making sure that we all lead through our values. In the statutory operations team in particular, um, given the audit of practice last year and given some of the findings of the audit of practice around the staff and how they were feeling um, and, and how they wished to make a more valuable contribution, Cynthia in particular has led a very comprehensive um, uh, team development with that team and through that team and also through her other services in the directorate. And I don't know, Cynthia, if you want to pick up on some of what we've been trying to do there. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, I suppose it is. I mean, we we um, have said when we we've been here before, it was about setting out the stall that we, as a service, would be open and transparent and child centred, and that was absolutely the core to everything that we did, um, and that was where our starting point was. And I suppose for the year that has been in it, and we have had COVID to, to deal with and all of the challenges that, that that brought, it was about giving the staff the climate for change. We have an excellent staff, and I, and I do want to underline the amount of work that has went on within the service this year uh, in relation uh, to the staff. But And it was about uh, really giving them the the tools to do the job that they wanted to do and that was to make things better for children and young people so there was a lot of the systems and processes that we put in place to give them the tools to do that but actually now we're moving i suppose into a medium or longer term uh, change where we're moving almost into more of the fundamental questions rather than the functional operational uh, processes and what we've been doing is, is extensive work really we've had We've uh, baselined the qualitative and quantitative, um, I suppose, analysis of where the service is and, and how people feel the service and where it is at the moment. And that's not just looking at staff use, but also looking at, you know, how the, the wider picture of, of where the service is at and how people view us. Um, we've had many engagement sessions, actually, looking at our values and practice and values in action. But it's also to recognise that it's not just the statutory operations team and I think this is this is a really clear point that has come out to us as the year has went on. Um, it is about all the other teams that interact, and therefore within the division, actually, um, Una and I have met um, with all of the stage three services. Just that the um, and that has been looking at where the services are, what is the culture in services at the minute, and how can we build that culture to make sure that people are ready for change, and people are ready for change. Um, they need the framework to do it, and I think the the program will do that. But we have we have worked really hard in uh, trying to change that culture where people feel that openness, transparency, and child centeredness is the description of their service. And okay. Staff have worked hard to do that. Okay, thanks, thanks, Pat. Thanks, thanks Chair. Robin Newton, MLA, and then Daniel McCrossan. Robin, please, thanks. I thank you, Chair, and can I thank Sarah and Una and Cynthia for uh, being along uh, with us today. Uh, first of all, let me welcome the fact that you have met the 26 weeks target of statementing. I think that's uh, a boost to confidence. Uh, I do welcome the fact that you're now much better at collecting the data around um, there's a more sophisticated approach to that data reference the uh, school intakes. That seems to me to be a very positive step. I wasn't going to go to this question uh, around the statementing, but could I just ask you very briefly, and then before I come to uh, a couple more questions, in terms of the, the team that assesses the, 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 the child, apart from yourselves, who else is involved in that? 
apart from EA. So it yeah. would be so basically what happens is there there's when we say the assessment, that's only part of the overall process. So what will happen is the children or we will ask when a child is referred, we'll ask for advices from a variety of people. And some of those are our own educational psychologists, own services, from schools, from parents. But then the other big partner that we have here who will provide advices to help give the whole picture for the statutory assessment is health. And it's the, each of the different sections uh, within the Health and Social Care Trust. And those are the big partners, really. Okay, that, that's fine. And I presume if there are minor specialist partners, if required as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, and am I right in thinking that no child is refused? It's a level? Am I right in that language? I don't know. I don't think so. They refused for the statement, the statement itself. Refused yeah. for a statement, yes, you can be refused for a statement because I suppose when you go through all of those advice givers, they are helping to make up the um, decision or they're helping to make up the, the body of evidence uh, to make decisions. So there can be a refusal um, at, at that point and it may be what is called a note in lieu uh, can be sent uh, to um, to schools and, and, and to parents where it may give advice, where the professionals will give advice um, that may support the child without the formal assessment. Okay, so that would be advice to the school in hard to deal with whatever the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to use the word problems, but the, the issues around the particular yeah. pupils. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Can I ask you then, in terms of, you mentioned that you're... Uh, making a putting a proposal together for the minister could you very briefly outline to us what would be in that uh, proposal and what you're intending to cover yes um certainly and um, i'll i'll take that one uh, cynthia and uh, really actually what we're developing um is a costed outline business case, if you like. So we have our overarching program approach. We have all of the recommendations associated um, with what we need to do to deliver those. We have our 15 key projects. And really what we're attempting to do there is answer the question, I guess, we've been asked all along and to do that with some detail, which is how much would it take to fix this? Um, so that's a very detailed piece of work that's underway um, and really, what we want to do there is provide the minister with a full outline business case that will finally describe what we believe it will take to address all of the issues that are there. So we expect that to be significant um, and we expect that to be completed by the end of this academic year. So I wouldn't want to comment on its on its content, if you like, in terms of that being de de developed as in how much and what does that mean? But the idea is to take this programme approach that we have um, and to take what we've heard from our stakeholders and our reference group and to say if we were to meet this if we were to meet all of these needs and this expectation, this is how much it will cost us to do that. And, and we believe that that will um, bring us to a better place in terms of describing the totality or the quantum of the costs, but also then some of the decisions that, that may need to be made around that. I presume you're talking about uh, the cost uh, outside of your own current budget? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you for that. Can I then maybe just again briefly in the time that we have available, uh, the seven recommendations from uh, from PAC, could you briefly run us through where you are against each of those recommendations, and particularly number one? Okay, well, number one um, is uh, a recommendation for DE. Um, so that is around the independent review of the EA. So uh, DE have accepted that recommendation oh, yeah. and they will take oh, that yeah. forward. So that yeah. will be, that oh, will be for DE. 
No, yeah. that's okay. Recommendation to you again is around the external review of SEND services. Um, and again, it will be for DE to decide how they wish to commission that piece of work, and we will work with them in that. In relation to the rigorous performance monitoring um, of EA against the, the, the statutory time frame, there is a SEND governance group now in operation at DE, and it's chaired by the Permanent Secretary, and I account to that governance group on a monthly basis in terms of what began, as we know, as a statutory operations issue, but has become much, much wider, and it's the overarching SEND programme. So I report through, and our chair reports through, mm -hmm. that SEND governance group. I'm doing this at a very high level, Robin, so you will excuse me. You'll understand that there's more detail. Um, Sarah, conscious I, yeah, I can step in as well. Rob, Robin, your friend and colleague, um, chair of the PAC committee, William Humphrey, my want me to remind that we can't go into this in too much detail, so that, that kind of high-level commentary is, is helpful. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I just did, didn't want you to feel it was rattling through it, so I just wanted to... We can't, we, can't, we can't really go into too much detail anyway, so thanks, thanks for that. Okay. Okay, you want me to keep going at a high level then? Recommendation four is around the board satisfying itself around the uh, information provided to it and its challenge function. And again, we've accepted, DE's accepted that recommendation. And to say that our board um, have, have a statutory, uh, statutory operations subgroup and that subgroup, um, that subgroup, T took the recommendations of the PAC report and satisfied themselves that we were making the right and appropriate changes and doing the right things that we needed to do to attend to that. We've also reviewed our committee structure and we've just changed our committee structure um, with, a, with a much uh, greater emphasis and focus on our um, board assurance. So there's been significant work in that area. In terms of recommendation five, that's about the management information held at EA. Um, and again, we've accepted that recommendation. We've done a lot of work through the statutory operations process, as, as you've seen, and you'll have seen in your reports that have come forward in terms of being able to actually identify and present the data. We have a way to go um, with our information management, and, and we're very open and honest about that. And what I would say is that really to be in the place where I would want us to be around our information management, we would require additional resource but we fully accept that we have work to do on that um, and then in terms of the funding allocated to SEN uh, again DE have, uh, have, have accepted that recommendation and that's something that we really want to have a look at in terms of the, the Northern Ireland Audit Office report both in 17 and in 20 and this were clear around our ability to demonstrate value for money and that's something we really need to get in underneath and have a really good look at how in this space can we can we show and demonstrate value for money and how do we focus on outcomes, I guess, is a big part there. Um, and there. And then the final recommendation was recommendation seven was around the conceding of appeals. And I think Cynthia has tried to take you through just some of the work that we've been doing in that space. Okay, Robin. Yeah, can I just ask, Chair, at, at what stage might... Uh, well, this is maybe for a committee request, but at what stage might um, Sarah be able to provide us with some detail on the progress, even against those elements or those recommendations that uh, are progressing? I understand that PAC is going to look at the MOR in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, and as, as members know, it has, PAC has primacy over its reports, so the clerk will let okay. you know when. Okay. Okay. That's fine, sir. Thanks, Rob. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Daniel McCrossan, MLA, please. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, thank you to our guests. You're very welcome, and thank you for uh, the answers to the many questions so far. Uh, Sarah, I appreciate from the outset your acknowledgement that there were serious issues here and still are, uh, and that you as Chief Executive are doing all within your grasp and power to address them. Uh, and uh, may I say at the outset that you have our support in the SDLP uh, to do that, but there is a number of things that will need to be done, uh, and in particular, a culture change at the Education Authority in order to sufficiently address some of the 
very serious systemic failures by the education authority, particularly when it comes uh, to our children. And we've seen uh, in a very public way how uh, young children, uh, uh, SEN children, families have been affected, uh, particularly during the pandemic, but indeed uh, right before it as well. I have a number of questions, Sarah. There, there, there's quite a, a long point, so you, you might need to jot a few down. But uh, I'll fire in. Uh, we all know the very unsatisfactory percentage figures that materialise from a number of sources, including your own audit in relation to the backlog of statutory assessments that did not conform uh, within the 26 uh, weeks to complete requirement. Uh, it is very pleasing to note that you're now reporting full compliance. And I'm just wondering, as a, as a supplementary point to that, uh, would you consider uh, an independent review of that to ensure it's the case? And there, I'm not asking that to be awkward. I'm asking that to ensure public confidence in the process. That's the first point. Secondly, what did you do from January 2021 onwards uh, that saw the number of statements uh, completed rocket? Uh, your figures on chart two of the paper show a 100% increase over a three-month period, and, and that, that's clear from page 146 of the papers. Secondly, going forward, do you believe, Sarah, as Chief Executive, that you're in a position uh, to deal with the potential pent-up demand, as you describe it, of COVID-impaired referrals? I note in this context, the number of open cases increased by 203 in the last month. And again, that has been provided in the paper. And uh, another point, sir, and, and sorry for this, they all tie in. Similarly, do you have the resources in the Education Authority and capacity to continue to meet completion targets when the time frame is reduced to 22 weeks? And finally, how have you reviewed the valid exception rules and application? And how have you improved the security and information governance protocols? Quite a lot in that, but they all tie together. But thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'll ask Cynthia to, to and probably to join me in some of these answers. Uh, in terms of full compliance, um, would I would I welcome an independent assessment of that? Um, I haven't thought of that, Daniel, until now. What I would say is we've put our own checks and balances in place within the Education Authority so that a team who's not within the statutory operations, uh, who's not within the statutory operation teams reviews them. I probably haven't thought about an independent assessment in terms of public confidence. If it were to give public confidence, if it were to give Further, if it were to give further confidence, I mean, the amount of work that has gone on this year has been phenomenal. Um, and it's back to that. The staff have worked really hard and they have done a great job. And and, and if, if having some kind of independent assessment of that would allow those staff to lift their head and be recognised and acknowledged for what they did way above and beyond this year, then I would actually welcome that. And actually, I think that's probably a good idea, Daniel, and I will take that forward um, because, you know, I just really feel that there has to be something there um, yeah, around the work that's, yeah. that those staff did this year. So, yes, actually, thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, and I wasn't asking that to be in any way awkward. I do genuinely believe that you and your team are doing a huge amount of work and have, and I appreciate the honesty of which you came on to the committee today and outlining the issues. I just think that it would back up what you're saying and would provide a level of confidence in, in, in the process forward now as you go forward. That, 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 that's the important. But thank you for... For that. No, I think that's a great suggestion, and I will take that forward because, as I say, we just we need to, we need to be able to move on and, and to, to to move on to the to the work of, of reform and improvement, and not of, of statutory compliance. And so, if that helps us do that, I, I'm I'm absolutely clear that that's something we will now look into. In terms of the work between January and and March, Cynthia, you might want to talk about some of the real focus and energy and effort that went in at that point. Yeah. yeah. And maybe the process that you actually used to, to, to do this every month. Yeah, I suppose um, the process we use every month will take quite some time. The chair might be um, given out. But I suppose in relation to the number of statements uh, rising, Daniel, one of the, the, the big issues here, one of the things that we have been dealing with this year is the backlog. So you will expect that the statements will rise this year because there were statements sitting there that were sitting too long. So over and above, the staff have been... Um, trying to make sure that those statements uh, do move on. Um, the, the nature and I suppose the, the, um, 
uh, the differences from month to month as to the number of statements come forward very largely are to do with I suppose, the number coming through for referral and you can see that when you equate it to that table but also uh, the, the time of year and the nature of schools and how they how they refer so that there's different uh, months will be different levels of statements but I suppose even back to, to our previous point I, I would go as far as to say we've probably assessed uh, and made more decisions to actually assess children uh, this year uh, and I would expect that that will be um, that the, there will be if you like when, when that data can be provided in relation to send us that you'll see that those figures um, have the numbers of children turned down at that stage are less um, is there anything particular more in those figures that you want as I say I think the backlog this year and, and trying to do that is maybe um, is maybe skewing figures a little bit more this year, uh, Daniel, because alongside the normal processes we've been trying to deal with backlog. Yeah, just, just how, how did you manage it when clearly there was issues in managing it before? Okay, well, I suppose managing it was uh, from the very start was actually the audit of practice and identified for us clearly the roadmap, you know, the recommendations were there. Um, we then had to, I suppose, uh, quantify that a wee bit more and qualify it a bit more. A tremendous amount of work went into talking to parents who had, you know, really uh, significant issues and learning from those issues, and that helped us then to design uh, the action plans and the improvement plans that went into it. It was then setting out a very clear roadmark of where the action plans. Uh, in those action plans, there were seven work streams that we've reported on before, um, which gave us the structure, if you like, to, to um, help staff uh, to have the tools to do it. It was also very key pieces of work. Um, it was about the data quality, and I know members have referenced this this morning, but one of the, the, the I think, the uh, key contributing factor to feelings was the fact that caseloads, and I hate that word because these are children, but caseloads were uh, difficult to manage when you don't have that um, backdrop of the data that you need to actually be able to monitor uh, children um, and to monitor trends in planning. It was also about the digital. We've mentioned that our capital system was at the centre of this and um, I think we can't underestimate that this time last year we had a largely paper driven service and in two weeks we had to stand it up to be a digital service, literally two weeks and uh, that required an awful lot of changes to workflows, to the digital, to the uh, working, um, you know, for staff to work in a different way. And that gives us a very centralised um, process to monitor. It was also about putting in place the right communication, the right structures, the right meeting structures, the accountability, which had to be in there. And that was a, a strong element of, of any changes that we make. Um, and I know we've mentioned it a few times today, but I can't underestimate the whole cultural element of this because it was down to the day-to-day -day hard work, high expectations that we we're going to change this because one of the things that was in the audit of practice was that there was potentially an expectation that it wouldn't change, that we couldn't do what we've just presented to you today. And we were absolutely adamant that this would happen um, and staff were willing to come along with us. You can't change unless you have engagement from people and whether that's schools and partnership or whether it was the staff, that's that's the that's what we needed to do, and that's where the hard work continues to be. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Bigger, yeah. bigger focus and accountability, Daniel, is how I will summarise it. So, and on that on that um, on that note, do I have do we have the resources and the capacity to move to the twenty two week time scale? My answer to that is no, and that will form part of our cost of business case. Um, in terms of sustaining 26 weeks, as we say, there was a there was a real determination on the part of everyone involved that this, that this would be met by the end of March, and I don't believe we are in a sustainable position around that in terms of the additional effort and hours that staff put in. So one is sustaining 26 weeks, and two is then moving to 22 weeks. We have a job of work to do there, um, and we will need and require additional resources to do that, and that will form part of that outline business case. So there's no doubt we will keep the focus on this, but there is no doubt. And, and Cynthia and her teams, who I have met directly um, during March, will tell me that the structure 
that they have in place is not right and that we need to do more. We have uh, temporary staff in place who will need to make permanent, etc., etc. So, so no, we do not have sufficient resource to move to 22 weeks. And in fact, we will need additional resource, I would suggest, to sustain 26 weeks. In terms of the, and I think that will link to the potential COVID impaired referrals. So again, no is the answer to that question. Um, and we'll have to, uh, at least, at, at least we believe that we are in a better place now should, should the COVID, which we're all probably anticipating to be honest, but should the COVID impaired referral spike come through, at least we do not have the significant backlog now that we need to work our way through. And so we believe we are in a better position, but okay. it, it remains to be seen what that will be. And so I'm going to answer no to having the resource to deal with that as well. Um, and in terms of the valid exceptions, we did not apply any valid exceptions. The figures that we have brought to you are raw um, with no valid exceptions applied. We made a very clear and deliberate decision to do that and that's about the public confidence thing and it's also about making sure that there were no suggestions that the figures were somehow using valid exceptions to distort or contort them. What we did not have was a process for following valid exceptions up and as long as we did not have that electronic systemic process we did not believe that we could actually uh, apply them or we be believed we would lose sight of them again. So we, 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 we've done it the hard way. We believe that was the right thing to do. We will have to apply valid exceptions. They are there and they are valid. We are nearing completion of the design of the system to flag and follow up those valid exceptions. And we've made a decision that we won't do that until we are in an absolute position to follow them up. And where I think the valid exceptions are really, really important for us is the trend data around them. So what is being applied when and how, and then seeing the changing trends over time as well. So in Cynthia's doing her case reviews at the minute, for example, she would suggest that valid exceptions around newcomer families are probably becoming more pronounced now than say valid exceptions around health. So it's important we do capture that data. It's important we know that so that we can respond to that. Um, so we will be applying valid exceptions once we have the system in place to be able to follow them up. Um, and I think that probably becomes even clearer um, when we move to 22 weeks that we are absolutely over all of these. And the other thing we will want is some kind of set ourselves some kind of maximum time scale in which someone could be a valid exception, for example. So those triggers, those follow ups, because that's not a road down which we wish to go again. Um, and in terms then of the data security and the information governance, again, Cynthia has alluded to it. Uh, COVID, COVID's really focused our minds on all of that. So in terms of electronic referrals, emails, etc., cetera, um, we've really just had to be able to make sure we find a secure way to do that. Um, and that's been really helpful, actually, in terms of meeting the 26 weeks. Okay. Final comment, Daniel? Yeah, Chair, it, 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 is, it is brief enough. Uh, st stage three, Sarah, thank you for that, uh, and thanks to, 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 to the others for the detailed answers. Stage three of the existing SEN code of practice, uh, there, there, there's often the need for specialist services provided through the EA to support children in schools, for example, behavioural support or MLD health or SPLD support. In the past, the waiting times from referral to the arrival of that support has been very, very long, sometimes well in excess of a year. So with that in mind, have there been any improvements in delivery times of late uh, or are uh, improvements uh, planned? Do you have any adequate resources to meet the identified need and reasonable timeframes? And finally, are these services seeing children face-to-face uh, -face yet? Uh, what about psychology in particular? Okay, so again, in terms of stage three services, that is one of our key projects. So in those key big 15 projects, stage three services is a big part. As Cynthia said, until we have sufficient resource at stage three, people will always rely on assessment. And actually what we want is early intervention and people accessing the services they need at stage three. And so therefore we do need to shore up stage three services. That's what will make all of this a success actually and will underpin anything that we do is shoring up those stage three services. Uh, behaviour support you mentioned. So no, we don't have enough of that. No, we don't have sufficient resource. No, we need more. 
Um, and I'll absolutely be on record as saying that. Um, Cynthia, do you want to talk about the seeing children face to face? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was really important to recognise that service ne services never stood down. So not only with statutory operations, but all of the other services were considered to be uh, critical in nature throughout the Education Authority's COVID response. Um, so I suppose as with the rest of the population, it's really important that you know service staff and educational psychology um, have the right risk assessments in place for going into schools, and that is um, about keeping the children safe. It's about keeping the um, those within school safe, and indeed uh, keeping our own staff safe. One of the positives I think that has happened with educational psychology this year is that actually we have begun to look at other ways because we've been we've, we've been I suppose um, uh, the onus has been on us with COVID find other ways of assessing apart from face to face and actually as a a school leader, I welcome that because it gives trust to the schools and, and uh, they can uh, help alongside psychology in making those assessments. But where face-to-face -face has had to happen in terms of assessment, we have made that happen. Even in the height of COVID, there were, for especially for early years children, um, where there was maybe social distancing was, was maybe more of a challenge, uh, there were assessment rooms set up so that people could come in and do that rather than in the school. But um, the, the um, I suppose, advice for us was to try to do assessments and uh, any direct intervention remotely as much as possible so that that would uh, reduce footfall within the school. Because I think you have to remember that these people are going from school to school um, and therefore they break a bubble within multiple schools per day um, and we need to be careful in that. But if I can give you even figures from last week, um, the, the literacy service, for example, um, Daniel, the week starting with the 12th of April, they had a um, 1,093 direct intervention se uh, sessions, and that's direct face-to-face, -face, and then 56 remote. So although we have our blended approach and we can do remote into the homes and actually uh, remote for, for children, we direct face-to-face, -face, we, we absolutely are out there again with. Um, okay. and, so. thanks, thanks for that. Thanks, Daniel. Robbie, Thank MLA. Okay, Robbie. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for that, guys. Um, yeah, not a lot to add, to be honest. Um, Daniel probably covered most of it. Um, but there's no doubt when you look at uh, the journey that you guys as a team have been on from your starting point and what uh, most of you have inherited, I uh, genuinely want to just go on record and, and say thank you for how you've driven the team, how you've managed the team, and, and, and how you've delivered the the figures that we're hearing about today in terms of um, the, the weights in around the 26 weeks. So that's, that is definitely a success. But just to test that a little bit, if it's okay, guys, um, can I ask you then, and um, forgive me if it's been covered, but in terms of um, appeals to the outcomes for um, the assessments, so are we, are we doing a qualitative assessment at the same time? So obviously we're, we're, we're concentrating here on the numerical assessment and hitting those targets. Um, so in terms of the qualitative assessment, um, and one of the ways I suppose that can be measured is by uh, appeals, could you sort of quantify that for me, please? Do you want to pick up just on some of the work that's back to the quality of the statement and also then the appeals? Yeah, piece? absolutely. I suppose quite, quite a lot of this year has, about, has been about those numbers in terms of uh, quantity, but we're absolutely clear that quality is the next step. And, and as we've said, uh, Sarah said earlier, the quality of the statement is one of the aspects within the statutory assessment project uh, going forward and indeed part of the SEND Act. Um, uh, Robbie, in relation to look to looking at the the quality, if we look at appeals, just to, to mention uh, appeals, I mean there has been a reduction of appeals this year, and um, there's actually even been a, a change in the types of appeals, and part of that is because a number of them were because of backlog and because people were you know where where there were. Uh, people waiting. That was one of the reasons for appealing. We, we're, we've addressed that and you can see that starting to come through in the, the clear reduction in appeals this year. The other areas of um, analysis that we're looking at is obviously our correspondence correspondence with parents, um, even our complaints correspondence. And anecdotally, my teams are telling me that actually 
one of the things that, that has so changed is that they're not getting that constant barrage of frustration at the end of the phone. And I know that's hard to quantify, but it's really important because that's showing that the relationship um, is improving. And I'm hoping that parents are moving into a phase that they can begin to trust um, and trust the staff on the ground. So that's the, the qualitative uh, work that's going on, but a good way to go. Yet, Robbie, you know, we're, we're on a journey. Um, and uh, yes, uh, looking at the quality of statement is, is a, key, a key one of those. Okay, um, and, and actually to be fair, um, Cynthia, you did sort of, you've, you've sort of put a toe into my next question. It was about the assessment of parental and, and children's experience then since this improvement a panel has been set up. I mean, I think that was probably one of the criticisms before and obviously it was exacerbated and magnified by the extended waiting times for completed assessments. But I think it's important and maybe there is um, some something you can give us today with regard to either um, a high that's being collated at the moment uh, and if not, then maybe a commitment that, that the, the parent and the, and the child or the carer's experience is actually being measured and built upon too um, over the next uh, whatever six months or years these other uh, reviews take place. Yeah, yeah I think, I think uh, Robbie, you're hitting on a very important point in terms of the participation of families and the participation of young people in, in terms of how we understand their experience and, and listen to what it is they're telling us so we can make progress. Um, and that is why the reference group is made up of a number of umbrella organisations who actually represent parents. And we are encouraging parents to, to uh, connect in with those. We also listen to individual parents, of course, but those, those um, organisations are actually on our behalf. They're engaging with their networks. So they're already working with parents to help us to um, to understand what their what their challenges are and how we can help them, and we'll continue to do that. Our youth service will work with young people directly, and um, for those young people who have been through this process and have been subject to the the state making process, it's really important that they're also heard and that their views. Indeed, that's something the legislation, the new legislation, um, is is very much promoting, and it's something that I am very keen to um, to make sure we facilitate. So those are those are absolutely key fundamentals for us moving forward in the next year. Brilliant. Um, I noticed this, this has been touched on. Um, two of the, the criticisms of the previous iteration of how this was done was the culture within this this part of the, uh, the, the authority, if you like, and also uh, how data was captured, how it was collated, and the fact that it wasn't shared. Could you give us a, an update that, to how you actually tackled that and I don't know if this is a cheeky question or not, but has there been any staff movements to facilitate that? Do you want to talk about the cultural, the yeah. cultural piece and the work with the, the teams? Yeah, I suppose as we, as we had said there earlier, uh, Robbie, we have done a lot of work with the staff teams, um, putting the structures in place for them and having that openness within the staff teams themselves because practitioners on the ground know what needs done here. So it was important to listen to them to see what actually needed done within the service. And, and giving people a voice has been a very um, positive thing this year. And actually the, the baseline questionnaire that returned, obviously you have your qualitative staff that come out of that, but the, the commentary that went behind it from staff has been absolutely um, uh, you know, heartening to see them saying about the change in culture that they have seen and how they feel more valued as individuals within the service um, and how they're up for the change. And that, that shows that, that aspect of culture uh, moving on. But as I said earlier, we have, you know, quite a program, an extensive program actually designed uh, for statutory operations staff in relation to uh, values in action, basically, if we call it that, values in practice, values in action. Um, but they're only one service. We've also been, we've started this exact same process, the blueprint, if you like, um, with all of the other services. And Una and I have met with the staff within those services over the last month, really. We've had um, engagement sessions and focused on this very issue of culture and where the service is. And, um, you know, so I think there's been a real change and it's, it's really heartening to be able to see that as a leader of these groups. Yeah. No, I, I think Robbie, one of the things for me is connections. Um, the connect, I think this is a team that actually worked, felt quite isolated. And whenever we hear some of the comments from our staff saying we've, not, you know, we haven't been listened to, in fact, we haven't been listened to even by by line managers 
or senior line managers and that um, and yet now what they're telling us they have an open door they know where to get us when they want us they've had their chief executive actually come into their team meetings to tell them that they're valued and that the whole of the more corporate leadership team is behind them in this in this huge effort and acknowledging that and celebrating that and um, certainly the board our board members are sending them um, you know responses and, and sell it, you know to, to acknowledge their contribution so but they're also connected to other organisations, to, to both across our directorates, with to other teams and to health, and, and that joined upness that yeah. is has to be a theme of everything that we do, and those relationships um, are really pivotal to a lot of of this, this this success. And I do think, and I'm going to say it here, there's been very strong leadership within this team, um, you know, through through our through. Cynthia and through our heads of service and through our team leaders, but also the strong leadership within our practitioners. And many of them are stepping up and bringing their teams and encouraging their teams. And that is about achieving excellence. That, that real EA value that we want to achieve excellence. And this will be a center of excellence if we get the support that we need through this program approach um, to deliver in the way that we know we can. Brilliant. Um, can I just uh, say, I'm not just, um... Uh, genuinely, um, from your start to now, I have been hugely impressed uh, with the leadership that you have given on this particular issue and the team that you've pulled together. Um, and politics is often the place where I'm sure you filled with dread coming on to a committee like this um, and get the, the traditional political um, tirade and so on. But, but what I would also challenge you with is to, to not rest on our laurels at this stage because this is just the start of the journey. And hopefully, in terms of, I know you guys, in terms of your leadership that you're giving your team, we also have a role to play to try and encourage you guys when you are doing it right. Uh, and also, if there's anything that this committee can do in terms of that funding that you mentioned earlier for the priorities that are coming forward. And transparency is the absolute key here, because I find in all meetings with parents, for instance, the more transparent I can be with a parent in terms of what I can deliver, if I'm asking for help, it really does help. It really, really does help. And this is my final question, guys. I'm sorry for going off piece, Chair. Last year, um, at the start of the school year, um, there were a number of unplaced children uh, and that continued for, for a quite a while and, and I was pursuing one or two of them and it was it was resolved um, and you know, I thank you for, for your help in that. When we come to uh, September time and if we take COVID out of the equation, has there been any work done to ensure that um, we don't revisit last year's uh, problems where we, we had unplaced children, uh, particularly with regard to special education days? Robbie, I'm gonna I'm gonna step in there if you'll allow me, and that it has been covered to some extent, and we are um, running out of time. Um, and if you want to summarise briefly, um, and I can refer Robbie to some of what has been covered there earlier as well, Una. Okay, Chair. Um, yes, we have a team set up, a cross-functional team that is set up where we can we meet on a, a weekly basis. It's part of our um, our it's, it's on our corporate risk register. We have a risk plan and implementation plan being put in place. Um, this is our priority to make sure that children have um, have placements, and we will be working through that. We have a new data system that has been set up to enable us to achieve that. So there's been a lot of effort probably going into actually making sure the children have placements. It's not without risk. Um, there will be challenges. There's a lot going on in relation to um, making sure that we have the right um, facilities, physical facilities. Our operations and estates team are helping us with that. So there's a huge effort going on at the minute, and, and our target is that, that we will be, you know, we will be in a position to have all children placed, albeit that uh, there is, a, uh, there is a, I suppose, some warning. Um, in relation to that, because it, it is, it, we have an increased number of children um, who require placement even over and above last year, so it is challenging. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robbie. I assure you there haven't been too many political tirades on my watch in this committee. Um, we've been robust, but not too many political tirades. Okay, let's bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA, please. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and again, thanks uh, to the three of you for coming um, to the committee today. As uh, has been said already, um, your work, you're obviously doing a lot of work to improve the provisions for special educational needs, but at the end of the day, we are here um, because children in the North with special educational needs and their families need our support. And to be honest, it's quite disappointing that in 2021 there are still so many children that aren't getting the needs that they require. So I suppose it's our job just to bring this to the fore and to make sure um, that improvements are made. 
Um, much of what I wanted to talk about has already been discussed, including um, Robbie just brought up the point there about engagement with families of children with special educational needs and children themselves, um, engagement and communication with them. So I'm glad to hear that they've been um, invited on to the reference group in that. Um, the other topic I wanted to discuss was funding. I actually brought this up with Rachel in the first briefing. Um, obviously, the all services, we need wider services for children with special educational needs and that needs proper funding. But there was an audit report, um, sorry, an audit office report um, saying that there, you know, vast sums of money were given to the Education Authority and the department but that they couldn't demonstrate value for money. Now, when I brought this up with Rachel, she had said, you know, it was really because it, it couldn't be demonstrated because of the lack of data. Have you anything to say about that there? And, you know, what value for money that your um, that the authority, how they've used it so far? Yeah, um, I think um, it was very clear in Northern Ireland audit recommendation that we couldn't demonstrate value for money. Um, and I think it's a difficult area in which to get the right outcomes to base uh, the demonstration of value for money. And I think we had that discussion at the PAC. Um, uh, we have accepted the recommendation, as I say, that, that, that is associated with that from the PAC report. And it's something we're now working closely with DE on around what are the outcome measures that we could use in order to fully demonstrate value for money. Um, in this area, it, it, it's been it's been difficult, and it always has been. So, I think we hope that some of the improvement work that we're doing um, will lead to some better identification of outcomes at each of the stages of the process. And I think that in itself will help us to identify value for money. I'm not sure in this space we'll ever get to the place where we can have very clear, rigid. Um, value for money indicators. However, we need to be in a lot better place than we are now. And that's certainly something in that recommendation we've committed to working with DE around how we generate the right outcome indicators to ensure that we are showing value for money. Thank you, Sarah. Um, this might sound a bit blunt, and I don't mean it to sound so blunt, but would you say that the money was well spent? I would say it's difficult to know. I would say it's difficult to know. It's difficult to know in terms of our investment in stage three services, for example, uh, early intervention. Um, and if we can get the right outcome measurements and get the right data that shows that an investment at a stage three service, for example, can prevent an assessment, then I think that that would be um, that would be ideal. I'm not sure we're ever going to get that clear delineation and that clear line. But what I can say to you is, in terms of the metrics that I do have, I, I couldn't, I couldn't with confidence say yes or no to that question. And that's a problem. And that's what the problem we need to look at. Yeah, but that it certainly is a problem, Sarah, because as I've said before, you could throw all the money in the world uh, at any um, subject if it's not being utilised properly, then it's no good. So you're you're 100 percent right there that it needs to be addressed. Um, Chair, I don't have much else to talk about. Um, again, thanks to the three of you for um, attending this morning. It has been a really um, important um, topic to discuss. So appreciate your time. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for those questions, Nicola. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Una. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, sorry, you're two weeks in the hot seat. Or sorry, two weeks, two years in the hot seat now. Had you any um, appreciation before you got into the hot seat what, what you were facing? <laughs> You've silenced me, Justin. <laughs> Let the record show that you've silenced me, Justin. Um, I always knew there would be challenges, Justin, with the role, because there always will be as a chief executive of a large public sector organisation, first of all. Secondly, I knew we had challenges internally, having been a director in the organisation, around public confidence in some of our services. 
and feedback that I'd received from parents, from school leaders, from others that I met when I, you know, when I was out meeting with people in the period one when I was a director and two before I was appointed. So I knew I knew we had public confidence issues, I knew we had reputational issues, and I knew were those um if you like were the were the key key areas of, of concern that were being articulated were. Um, so uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. In terms of the last two years and, and is it as exactly as I expected it to be, the answer to that is no. Okay, well, you, you've said that you've uh, now got your statutory assessment period. Um, you're down now in accordance with what your your uh, targets are. So that's a success, given where you're at. And um, so you, des you deserve applause for that. Um, but obviously, it's not it's not the, you're not there yet in terms of what needs to be done and delivered for by the education authority. And um, you've mentioned about the culture change piece, and I've been on to you about this quite uh, for quite a long time now. And you've done significant work there in bringing people along and moving the culture forward to where it needs to be at in order to deliver for for children and young people and their families. What what are you, what are your values, sir? My values. What are the, what's the, the what are the values of the education authority? The education authority's values are openness, excellence, equality. I've taken a blank. Okay. Openness, excellence, equality. I don't know what the other two are then, because clearly they're not up there with openness, excellence and equality. But if we start with openness, excellence and equality, and I think, Justin, there is a bit, because they're, they're the things that Cynthia has described that we have dr really driven through with some of these changes, which is we do expect excellence. It's not good enough. It's excellence um, and the openness and transparency. And I, I've set my stall out on that as well in terms of our communications and in terms of... of, of of our communication with others and, and us becoming a, a listening organisation um, as well as a responding organisation. And to me, that has been right at the heart of what we've, we've done. What's, what else is the bottom of the letterhead yeah. there? Yeah, no, I'm just saying it's an important thing. It's about translating um, all of these, these values and one of the statements that we include. And this is to inspire, support and challenge all our children and young people to be the best that they can be. And I think that has to underpin everything um, everything that we do. And it is also about that value of, you know, of inclusion and respect. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm looking at your website now and I'll see what your values are on the website. But um, having worked in a, in a high performance company in a previous life, um, the way I try to impart this piece about values is if you're not prepared to fight for it, it's not a value. And uh, the way I tried to communicate this with the teams working with, uh, I'd say to them, if you, if you rang up anybody in your team and, and in the middle of the night and asked them what their values were, asked them what the organization's values were, they could tell you. So that's how strongly those values should be embedded. And that must come from the top. But I know, sir, you're, you're on the, under the pressure. It's, it's easy for me to put you on, on, on the spot and ask you those questions. But it, it, it must be embedded to that level in the organization because values guide mm -hmm. behavior and drive performance. They are the bedrock of your culture. And they can be the, the, the aid to help you move that culture forward. So that's the level of which values should be embedded. Um, in terms of the communication with parents in relation to the changes that are, that are afoot within the organisation, how, how has communication improved or changed with parents and families in relation to the uh, statement process? I think it's changed at a number of levels, um, Justin, from individual practitioner level through to dealing with queries or complaints or inquiries through to insurance that parents have a voice on the project reference group and that they are key and integral to some of that co-design that we want to do. So it's a bit... And everything we've done, as Una's talked about the connections, so I suppose in everything we've done, we've tried to make sure that we are connecting and communicating at all of those different levels so that we have the opportunity to influence strategically and influence the design, that we have the learning from listening to parents and from cases and from complaints and things like that. But then we also have the on-the-ground individual practitioner communication, and we've tried to improve that with parents. At all of those levels, we've tried to improve that with our colleagues in health. 
in all of those levels, for example, uh, in everything we've done, we've said about trying to make sure that, that the, the individual practitioner is, is improved, that the organisational communication is improved and that the strategic communication is improved. So they're a core part of that, that co-design, but that's not enough. It's not enough that we have them as a core part of core design and then our day-to-day -day delivery doesn't reflect what we're doing. So we've really tried to match and marry that as best we can. Cynthia, do you want to say anything more on that? Just to add, and I would like to comment that, but just to add some practical supports, and it's always good to have those practical supports, um, you know, things like more upfront information on our website to actually be able to um, help parents to understand statutory processes. It's a very complex and difficult process, but also you'll find on our website a lot of um, additional resources for children with special educational needs that parents and family schools um, children can actually um, tap into as a as a support and then as I've referred to earlier it's um, you know looking at the, the link officer on the ground making sure people know who the, the, the person is that they can contact at within the authority and you know Sarah mentioned the value of openness open door is the key here so you know parents with all of that, are still having issues and they still need to contact somebody. We have left, left that as a very clear message in statutory operations. It should be open door, and um, that that is underpinning everything. But I suppose I've tried to put in place practical things to help people manoeuvre through the system as well. Okay, what's the cost of losing the tribunals? Going through the tribunal process and what it appeals, what's the cost to you of losing those appeals? Those Tribunals and of implementing the findings of the tri tribunals. I don't, I don't have that, Justin, with me today. But again, I know there's other information has been requested on that, so I will send that through with the other information. Okay, back to the time period of 26 weeks statutory periods, um, where where children are being stipended as as, as appropriate. Um, are the cap cap capabilities and capacities there still to get the children the supports that they need? You know, so it's one thing having the statement, but it's another thing having the actual support that they actually need. Is that? It absolutely right? is. You're right, um, Justin, and actually that's always why the 26-week time frame has been so important. It's not a time frame and it's all right. It's a time frame that, that should result in supports being in for children. So yes, that's a key part of what we're trying to do, which is to make sure that there are no unnecessary or undue delays then in terms of, of the support. And again, that forms part of our overarching programme and, and our key one of our key projects is making sure how we get the support in place more quickly. And again, we have that on a on a number of levels. So for example, UNIS teams working very closely with our transport team now uh, in terms of that pathway to to just take out any of those unnecessary steps that were potentially internal in EA between UNIS team and the transport team and how, how we just um, make that happen. Um, if you like, I probably haven't answered your question very eloquently there, Justin, but I hope that gives you a sense of... Okay, we'll just find yeah. you back. back yeah, final culture. comment, thanks. Culture comes from the top, and um, I'm really impressed by your steeliness and integrity and determination, sir, and the, of the three of you and Cynthia as well. You're a team here working together. You're all very determined to make change happen here and lead from the front, and that's crucially important. And uh, I wish you luck. Now, you have a big, big job, big, important task ahead of you, but I think you're on the right track. Keep going. Best of luck with yours. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Justin. Well, is Morris Bradley with us? Or it looks like he may have dropped off, yeah? He seems to have dropped off, Chairperson. Okay, okay. Look, we're tight for time. So, um, Sarah, uh, uh, Una, Cynthia, thanks uh, very much indeed for your time with us today. Um, there's a number of ongoing, significant, important issues there. Hopefully, we can maintain engagement with you um, and before the, the summer recess, maybe engage with you again on, on some of those um, key items. As many members have acknowledged, um, you, you, in many sense, um, have taken on responsibility to deal with systemic feelings that have been years in the making. So we, we acknowledge that and we acknowledge the, the, the commitment, effort and, and expertise that you're, you're bringing to address those issues and to improve provision for children with special educational needs. But we will continue to 
work with you on that. And, and I think you'll agree that there is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that we do uh, get our, our children with special educational needs the full equality of opportunity and inclusion to which they're entitled. Yes, Chair, we absolutely acknowledge there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, I feel there may always be work to be done because we'll always want to strive for better. So I'm um, happy to work with the committee and engage with the committee on that. Um, absolutely. Thank you. And maybe in particular, as I said, or if we, we could be kept up to date with regards to those school placing issues um, in, the, in the next few months, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and to add members back into the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise our actions from that briefing? Okay, members, um, so we agreed at the last session, at the last evidence session, that um, we might have combined um, actions here. Um, so the EA there have um, defended. Um, the record in the in the um, period of, of reform that has rolled out so far, um, and the period of response to um, critical reports, um, the uh, there was a question raised about um, accountability, whether you know it lay with officers or um, you know between officers and boards. Um, um, the improvement plan is going to. Well, it will certainly take time um, and will address systemic and cultural issues. Um, so it, I think in writing to the EA in the first place, there are certain actions um, asking for an update on unplaced children or to be kept up to date on unplaced children, um, as the chair just mentioned. Um, the uh, question of the new special school for Belfast um, is wrapped up in the area planning consultation, which closed on the 12th of April. It is in the committee's forward work program to look at that um, in due course. So obviously, um, the authority is going to need a little bit of time to collate consultation responses. Um, that's that's in the planning. Um, the deputy chairperson um, asked the EA to engage with Children's Law Centre as a matter of urgency. So I think we can reflect that in correspondence. Um, and also, um, Pat asked for the number of assessments refused in the period. Um, reported to the committee. So there was a very robust uh, rebuttal of any manipulation of figures um, for statutory compliance, however. Um, also then, um, Daniel had a question about um, an in whether the authority would consider an independent review of the work done on the backlog just for independent assurance for, and, and public confidence. Um, so I think we can put that in the letter. Um, EA said they were happy to do it, and hopefully we're avoiding cross-cutting with PAC's recommendations here. Um, the, the question of resource in the, in the first session, Children's Law Centre, you know, wondered whether resource wasn't being um, d discussed up front. The EA have just said that um, it was a huge effort to sustain the twenty. 26 weeks target and that that is not sustainable without additional resource and um, they said that moving to 22 weeks will require additional resource and um, covid referrals will require additional resource and um, three delivery delays um will require additional resource um so so really there's a range of things there that um the business case which is being developed by eea um will address um, I mean, the, the committee may wish to support that call for resource um, in its, in, its uh, in writing with the department. Um, okay, um, Robbie again came up with the unplaced children issue. Was wondering could he have an assurance that no child would be left unplaced at September twenty twenty one? Not sure if I want to put, um, put that in um, and. It just an ask about what the cost of appeals actually is amounting to. So I think those are those are questions for EA and um, in the instance of supporting the case for resource, that would be a letter to the minister in my view. Yep. Is that comprehensive members? Um, members wish to add anything to that? Uh, Chair, it's only a small point, uh, but maybe if if we're asking on the 
position of the unplaced pupils. Could we ask for a confirmation of what the current situation is and then perhaps ask for monthly updates? Yeah, happy to, happy to agree with that, Robin. Yeah, good suggestion, Robin. Okay. Thank you, members. Did anyone have yes, any members intend to agree to this action or any other comments? Okay. Right. Thank you. If we can move then to agenda item seven, members. I refer you to page 159 where we have 12 items of correspondence. At summary note at page 160. And ask the clerk to speak to these items, please. Thanks. Sure. Uh, just before you start, members may wish to mute themselves until they're speaking just to avoid any background noise. Thanks. Thanks, Clark. Okay. Um so members one page one fifty nine has got the um uh, it begins the section on correspondence and um, there's a summary note at page 160 and there are 12 items of correspondence today. Um, item 7-2 um, on page 163 is uh, a response from the department about the General Teaching Council and um, providing further information. So the committee requested, um, as you will recall, um, a terms of reference for legislative changes at the GTC, terms of reference for the board effectiveness review, a flowchart of the current teacher misconduct processes um, that are in place at the moment um, in the absence of a uh, full set of um, powers, um, breakdown of the General Teaching Council's misconduct um, cases and details of actions taken to protect staff and council members um, in response to allegations of bullying. Um, so there's a lot of material there. Now, the committee has already agreed um, to uh, hear from the General Teaching Council again, and not just um, from uh, the previous witness, but from um, a range of uh, personnel. So are members content to um, bring that back to the committee as soon as possible and address this correspondence at that point? Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, members. Okay. Um, members, item 74 um, on page 181 is correspondence from the department um, providing a table of proposed legislation. Um, so that would be helpful in our forward work pl planning um, item just after this. Um, and just, uh, we are also likely to have uh, private members legislation um, come into the committee um, in the last year of the mandate. So legislation um, scheduling will be a significant part of the committee's work plan. Um, item 7.7 seven, seven, um, on well, page... Just Mark, if I could come in just to note the legislative programme does include um, a proposed education school starting age bill. It does. In relation to flexible school starting age. Proposed consultation date it states that given school reopening date for schools and summer holidays, it is unlikely that a consultation will start before 1st of October for a minimum of eight weeks. Um, an estimate of the time frame is uh, introduction will depend on executive approval of policy proposals post consultation. And then the column of completed in the current assembly mandate says this will depend on priority in terms of the overall legislative timetable. However, evidence-based policy development will inform future decisions in relation to when legislation might be introduced. Um, doesn't sound like a clear this will be completed in this mandate. Um, uh, we might want to maybe write to the minister to just seek the confirmation of the why a consultation would have to wait until the 1st of October. Members can kind of do that. Yeah, um, the the um, committee is going to hear from the department shortly as well about um, the, the school starting age. And it's my impression that the department needed to consult for longer than eight weeks, to be honest, but can certainly write about that um, in advance of the evidence session with the department. Okay. Just so okay. that given the support the committee has given um, together in relation to flexible school starting age, just so it's worth noting the proposed approach in relation to that 
that particular bill. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, item 7.7 7 on page 193 is um, correspondence from the Public Accounts Committee um, forwarding a letter about retired teacher um, advocate um, advocating for applied behaviour analysis for treatment of children with autism. Um, we actually felt that this correspondence was more likely um, in the uh, remit of the Health Committee. Um, so, members, if you're happy, we would uh, propose to forward that to the Committee for Health. Okay, agreed. agreed. Thank you. Members, if you just agree, the correspondence would be great. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, item 7 8 then on page 202 is a response from the Catholic Schools Trustee Service regarding the teacher's exemption um, in Theto. Um, a lot of correspondence has come back in response to the committee's um, inquiries about this, um, but we still to receive responses from the Executive Office and um, the Methodist Church and Transfers Representatives Council. Um, so members, if you're content, we'll just send a wee reminder to them and get that body of correspondence all back for your attention. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, item 710, um, members will recall that last week uh, in a, any other business, Will, William raised um, an email that he'd received um, about uh, Autism NI not having addressed mental health statistics. Um, they had been invited, obviously, to talk about mandatory uh, training. Um, so um, Kerry Boyd has helpfully provided just a wee statement um, setting out um, the, how that's such a priority for Autism NI and some statistics for members' um, attention. Okay. Um, thank you. Item 711 on page 215 um, is correspondence from... Sorry, can you, can, you, can you speak forwarded on to the correspondent, okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, a correspondence um, at 711 is from an individual about funding for educational attainment um, programs. Um, and it's just uh, as a policy matter, um, members may wish to raise funding for the extended schools program with officials um, at the budget briefing that's uh, part of next week's meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, member, uh, item 713 um, is correspondence from an individual raising concerns that some post-primary schools in Fermanagh are planning to put their, 12, their year 12 to 14 students on study leave. Um, so members, is, there, is that an issue that you would want to um, look into or raise with the department? Yeah, if we can correspond with the department in relation to that, members agree. Thank you. Agreed. Thanks. Um, okay, tabled um, today, there's an update from the department clarifying the nomination arrangements for transfers representatives on boards of governors. Um, Members are content uh, to note that clarification. Thank, Thank you. you. And also tabled is a letter um, from a special school principal in closing um, the consultation response that they offered to the EA's special needs area planning consultation. Um, again, are members content to note that letter and address those concerns in the round when the EA presents to the committee on the area planning consultation? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And otherwise, members, um, are you content to note or dispose of the correspondence according to the summary note at page 160? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Chair. Yes. Uh, just a uh, uh, forward work program. We're just about to get to it, yeah. Yeah, just before we go to know. And I know it's not because I've looked at it, but I've spoke with you about this already. We need to make sure that uh, SIA and the monitor before us in relation to exams uh, very, very soon, uh, because that window is fast approaching. And we need to do all we can as we steer SIA and the minister away from the same mistakes being repeated. So I, I think it's important that we get them slotted in onto the programme. Well, that's, that's moving the agenda item 8 then. Members, Stratford Work Programme is at page 221. 
uh, members of the and formal meetings have been scheduled with Apple Education, uh, the British Heart Foundation, and the NBS Sir Colin McGrath. Um, we also had a school day of engagement event uh, due to school restart, and we were reminded to reschedule this. Uh, we all also obviously had a very positive engagement recently with uh, youth uh, representatives uh, in a formal session, which was positively received, uh, not least by the Children's Commissioner last week. We members wish to proceed with the, the youth stakeholder event, and um, if they would, can I ask them to suggest the rules uh, for an invitation by next week and for a provisional date of the 26th of May? At 6 p.m., members can come to uh, forward suggested organizations for us to engage with uh, at, at a youth engagement event on the 26th of May, 6 30. Yeah. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Clark, can you, do you want to speak to the forward work program and, and we can consider where currently the education minister is proposing to attend committee and um, uh, see if that is adequately um, soon, or we need to change that? Yeah, the Minister um, has proposed to attend on the 19th of May, so members will remember that um, we did ask um, for his availability almost immediately after his last appearance at the committee, um, and that's the first opportunity that he has proposed. Um, so we've provisionally booked that in um, with the proviso that if something urgent come up in the meantime, we would nonetheless um, invite him again. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's four weeks away then, Clark, yeah? The 19th of May, yeah, so we're now the 21st of, yeah, of April, so four weeks, exactly. Okay, do, do members want the right to the Minister to ask if he can't attend um, sooner than that? Daniel, you'd raise that in particular there. So in relation to exams, particularly alongside C CEA, was it, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these assessments, that the, I'm sure other MLAs are the same, but uh, I'm having considerable correspondence from young people in particular to saying that their assessments have doubled in some instances, particularly GCSE. And I think it's very important that we um, speak with the Minister and see us straight away. I know previously he had said that that is not the intention, but the intention, in fact, are two very different realities, unfortunately. Uh, people are over stress, stress, and burden for young people. And I do feel that when it comes to these assessments, there's going to be uh, a lot of tears around the, you know, in the track again, similar to last year. Okay, so the members agree that we write to the Minister Perry and, and request uh, an earlier date for attendance of a meeting with the committee then? Great. Great. Okay. okay. And would that be additional to the 19th of May? I, I, I think we could change we could change that day if okay. uh, they were able to meet with us earlier and we'll we'll reschedule accordingly. Thank you, members. Okay. Um, I think uh, Clark, you also wanted to suggest that we have a, a planning session, uh, given that we have an intention to bring forward a, a number of motions. I have a draft text for a motion in relation to restraint uh, that I'll, I'll uh, share with members via the card this week. Um, and we'd also discuss motions on RSC um, and flexible school starting age if necessary after the briefing sessions were due to take. Um, if, uh, members think that it might be useful to undertake a, a dedicated planning session just to chart a way ahead in relation to some of those key issues, given the short time that's left with the mandate. If Ed Clark proposed some dates to uh, members be content with that, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can write to members with some proposed dates, and I mean, you could do it in an informal meeting on a Tuesday morning if members wished. Um, we have like a draft text to begin with, um, we could we could start from there. Um, I think um, in terms of priorities for the rest of the mandate, um, there's there's a there's a lot of, of uh, there's a lot of material that is already planned, and the legislation update um, I think is going to take up a lot of the schedule as well. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll write to members and ask them just to outline their priorities for the next year. 
That'd be great, Clark. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Members content to endorse the board work program as suggested. Great. Thank you. Okay, members, agenda item nine is any other business? Chair, can I just uh I hadn't realized that William Humphreys had sent me an apology. Uh, he's ill today, apparently. So if, you, if the clerk would uh, include that. Uh, and uh, I think that Morris had to go. I think he sent a message, but Morris had to leave for another appointment, Chair. Sure. No, no problem, folks. Both Julie, no problem. Thank you. Any other business members? No. Okay. Uh, thanks as always for a, a robust and comprehensive session there today on, on a really important set of issues. Date and time of our next meeting is next Wednesday, the 28th of April at 9.30 a.m. The committee does not adjourn. Thank you. Committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.